supposed to do the recording? Okay. Got it. Okay, I'll just start it. Okay, good. Thank you, Yantao. I assume that you're doing all those logistics. So, and thank you for catching that, Monty. So, yes, yeah, so I'll just start over again. So, welcome everybody to uh, track 2W of the Bridging Transportation Researchers Conference. This is the um, uh, so this is session on transport policy and safety. Um, my name is John Ivan. I'll be moderating this session. I'm a professor at the University of Connecticut. Um, I do research in, in transportation safety and, and, and traffic modeling. And, um, and actually will be one of the co-authors on one of the papers today. And, and so I don't want to take too much more time, but like I said, we have some very interesting papers here. And I, and I will be giving <laughs> each of the speakers um, 20 minutes to speak. And I think we'll have a little bit of less than 10 minutes for questions unless they finish early. So I'm going to try to keep it to one half hour or a little bit less than half an hour for each speaker. So our, our first speaker is Professor Montessir Abbas. Um, Monty Abbas is a professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Virginia Tech. His interests include traffic operations and control, traffic flow theory, driver behavior, and agent-based modeling and simulation. Um, and I'll, so I actually, before I say this, I would just suggest that uh, while the presentation is going on to help with bandwidth, it's helpful if we all mute and turn off our cameras. And then if you do have a question, I recommend that you uh, give the questions in the chat, type the questions in the chat, which I will check um, and I can see if, and, and we can see if there's any questions, but I would prefer that we take the questions at the end just to make things, um, just so we, to, to, just to keep things moving. So if you have any questions, you can start, we can put them over there in the chat and we'll handle them at the end of the presentation. All right, so I will go ahead and let Professor Abbas begin. Thank you. If you could please allow me to share a screen to the host. The screen sharing is disabled now. Yeah. I can share your screen. All right, thank you. Um, can you guys hear me and see my screen well? Yep, I can see it, thank you. All right, excellent, thank you very much. Um, so Amantia Abbas and the paper is co-authored with my student, Awad Abdel Halim. Uh, he's a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech, he's just about to graduate. Uh, and Dr. Jamal Hassan Sid Ahmed, uh, an associate professor at the University of Khartoum. So I'll be talking today about vehicle trajectory tracking on incident sites, a foundation for driver behavior pattern analysis in Khartoum, Sudan. Uh, my presentation outline consists of the following. Um, I'll talk briefly about the modeling and simulation for control framework that we're doing at Virginia Tech. Um, I'll talk about the safety surrogate analysis just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, I'll speak about our latest research effort on safety um, uh, on this paper uh, in particular. And then the collaboration with the University of Khartoum as a, um, a long-term um, vision and the next steps uh, in our work with them. Uh, so in, in a nutshell, um, as I mentioned, I'm interested in multi-agent uh, simulation and modeling in general. Um, and we do that in, in several ways. So whether we develop our own software or we work with existing software or we develop certain tools uh, to be plugged into that software um, are two approaches that we follow. So for example, if you look here with the uh, vSIM simulation, uh, we develop our own uh, agent behavior and embed that into vSIM so that we can capture uh, behavior that is not currently embedded in vSIM. Um, my main interest uh, was traffic control. That's where I started, traffic operation and control, uh, all the way from time-based control to traffic responsive control and adaptive control, and, and lately incorporating some music theory into the traffic flow theory and, and traffic control theory. Uh, but the element that was missing uh, was the safety aspect um, and how we can capture the safety heat maps at an intersection so that we can use that for control uh, to come up with better timing plan, with better uh, strategies and phase timing and so on so that we can improve the safety at the intersection. 
Um, so that will be the focus of today's presentation. Uh, but I just wanted you to, to be situated in the main framework that this, this is a component of a bigger framework that we're working on. To put everyone on the same um, page uh, for the safety surrogate analysis, um, basically uh, we use a time to collision as one of the elements. And if you look at these figures over here, you have time on the X axis and you have a distance on the Y axis. Uh, if you have two vehicles and one of them is going with a constant speed and the other one is going initially with a higher speed, then you could project that time um, forward uh, to, to get the time to collision. So if this vehicle doesn't change, if the driver doesn't change the behavior, there is going to be a time to collision in the near future. And you can plot that at this particular point in time, what is the expected time to collision? But then hopefully as those vehicles are moving, uh, this person is gonna come to their senses, they're gonna slow down, and now there is a new time to collision. And again, you can measure that and put it in and plot it in against time and so on. Um, ultimately, when this person decide to really uh, delay um, their arrival, expected arrival, basically coming to their senses or paying attention now, there's not gonna be a time to collision because it's gonna be infinity. There, these points are not gonna meet uh, and therefore it's not gonna appear here. But the point is if you just take two vehicles, you can get uh, a sense of what the time to collision is doing in terms of going up and down. So is that safety surrogate measure um, uh, getting um, um, more critical or less critical? Now, if you take all the vehicles in a, at intersection, and you start doing this analysis and you start plotting the time to collision um, or the frequency of time to collision below a certain value at every location in the intersection, then you can get the frequencies. Um, and as the frequencies become higher, uh, so let's say we're looking at a threshold of one second, for example. Um, and if we have that happening seven times or eight times or nine times in a certain location, that makes you pay attention that there is a problematic uh, the location right there. You can overlay that over an intersection and get a heat map for where those problematic locations are given the existing timing plan or, time or control plan. Um, and then you can use that to evaluate potential solutions as you move forward. So that's basically the gist of the framework or process that we are following in this paper. Now, to do this, of course, you need the vehicle trajectory data. You need to do the analysis for it. Um, you need a safety assessment and mitigation measures that you wanna, you wanna test and evaluate. The challenge is, is that when it comes to reality, you're gonna find some occlusion problems. Um, and then if you look here, this is an example of an occlusion. If we um, are having a camera looking at the intersection, a vehicle comes, by video trajectory and analytics can capture that uh, with existing tools. But then if there is a bus or if there is a building or anything of that sort, when that, that vehicle gets occluded and when it appears again, it is re-identified as if it's a new vehicle. But that's wrong. That's not a new vehicle as we know as humans when we look at it, it's the same vehicle. But the computer processing algorithms are not gonna know that and therefore they need to be adjusted. And that's the contribution that we have done uh, in this work. Uh, that's one of the contributions we have done. The other thing is about video quality and data processing speed. And that becomes important when it comes to collaborating with, uh, with Sudan. Um, and, and there is a reason that we wanted to collaborate there because the country is transforming right now. There is a new regime. There, things are getting better. We wanted to help them and we want to be uh, to improve safety um, uh, over there. Uh, but the video quality, the infrastructure, the data processing, all of these are issues in there. So we wanted to address that as well. The, what we have done um, is a, in, incorporating the domain knowledge um, in the virtual traffic lanes um, or VT lanes, um, the algorithm that we developed. And basically we use video feed from the infrastructure side uh, but we utilize flow conservation law within individualized NEMA phasing uh, movements. And I'm gonna talk about 
the NEMA phasing movement uh, in, a, in a minute to explain that. Uh, and this way we can address the vehicle identity switches and re-identification uh, of the occlusion issues. NEMA phasing, National Electric Manufacturer Association, um, <clears throat> is what is shown here. Yep, sorry, you, got, you muted me, so I had to get unmuted. Um, at an intersection for every movement, we assign a number to that movement. And, when, and then we have what we call the ring barrier diagram over here. Uh, and the NEMA phasing works as, like that. When, when time passes by, um, the number of those phases that are shown here is what gets green. And then time continues to go. So now we get phase two and six assigned green, then three and seven, and then four and eight. And things keep continuing in that fashion. So that's how um, a traffic controller currently works. Of course, you know, there are other uh, uh, elements and features like actuated controllers and coordinating these controllers with each other and so on and so forth. But, but this is a basic domain knowledge that we incorporate. So if we are tra tracking a vehicle that goes from phase four and another vehicle follows it, we know that now they are gonna continue going through. So we are not going to look for them again if they, you know, whether they are coming from this direction or that direction, that's impossible. We know where it is going. So this way we can reduce the errors and we can track um, vehicle queuing um, and so on. Um, uh, knowing or having in mind where those vehicles originated from and where they are anticipated to continue. So we developed this algorithm and, and basically in the very beginning, you know, that's the main part of the algorithm. Uh, we look at the video uh, and the first frame um, over here, we have a graphical user interface where we define uh, the NEMA phasing on the, on the picture itself, uh, so that when vehicles are starting to move, they get assigned an initial phasing um, that they follow through with. Uh, and then as we track the video sequencing, we use a yellow um, uh, algorithm to identify the vehicle and we use the deep sort based um, car tracker uh, so that we can track the vehicle uh, in the video. So we track all these individual vehicles. Uh, and then what we do in this portion of the work here is that if we don't find um, a vehicle, um, then we look at the surrounding uh, vehicles around it. Um, and we look at the nearest, do a nearest neighbor search. Uh, and then we, if, if we find a vehicle that actually has appeared uh, from nowhere, then that is going to be that, that vehicle. It's a simple uh, algorithm, but it's very effective um, in, in that sense. Um, and then if we identify the vehicle and we are sure about it, then we, we basically trust it and use it for future uh, re-identification of, uh, of vehicles as well. Um, then we wanted, as I mentioned, to work with, uh, with Sudan and Sudan specific objectives. Um, and in addition to the fact that we wanted to improve safety over there, uh, there are very unique features. Uh, if anyone goes and, and, and drive in Sudan, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about. The driver behavior is very, is very different in there. Uh, so it's a chance actually to study that behavior. And that's why I call the paper the foundational uh, uh, for uh, travel pattern or, or driving behavior pattern. Uh, in Sudan. Uh, so driver pattern there is very different. It is, it, I think it's beyond just the model calibration. Um, there are site specific assessment that we wanted to do so that we can suggest future improvement, uh, site improvement plan, uh, incident impacts on capacities, uh, and then incident uh, clearance time and modeling. So here are some example uh, from this pilot study. Um, we got these videos uh, from there, and then what you are going to see in just a few seconds, as these vehicles are coming from the side, this person goes too far to the left, 
and then you get a crash um, and luckily you know nobody got injured uh, nevertheless it's a, it's a crash and we could use our analysis to study that uh, you see a different kind of behavior happening here. And it's one of the things that I think it's interesting. Uh, people continue driving, actually. The, there is no uh, stopping or closure uh, of a certain lanes. You just continue going, uh, even that person is still in there. And then on, the, on this side, move a little bit forward, and you'll see as this, these vehicles are turning left, and we chose this because it's at night, so we can get a different perspective uh, of the modeling and analysis. You have these vehicles coming here, um, trying to turn. And then in a few, you're gonna see another crash happening, and then you're gonna see something um, that is different. Okay, so this is what happens. This car gets an impact, it goes back. And I wanna highlight this because I will remind you later in the, in the trajectories that we extract what you will see here. Uh, what's happening on the bottom is basically just the analytics um, run on those same videos. It always takes time, yeah, okay. So the trajectory analysis now running the, this algorithm that I've showed earlier, um, we wanted to identify problem location so that if we get a multitude of videos and we input those to the algorithm we wanted some kind of a measure that we can extract so we don't have to watch all the videos or that the agency doesn't have to watch all, all the videos uh, and then later on use that for uh, suggesting mitigation strategies and look at the incident back on capacities now this is a this is still a pilot uh, but i am expecting that when we look at the incident impact because of the different behavior. Uh, I think the incident clearance time, capacity reduction and capacity increase after the incident removal, um, I don't think that's gonna be the same as what we see here. I think that is gonna result in different models as we uh, complete that analysis. Uh, but this is, a, this is a video that I ask you to pay attention to. And you will see just looking at the trajectory analysis, all these movement up and down, um, uh, and, and that shows that the, that vehicle was not just moving and stopped moving, but it actually uh, suffered from the impact um, and, and, and moved uh, from its location. Whereas if you look at this video over here, you're gonna see that uh, this trajectory of a vehicle at the previous time step, obviously, um, was stopping right somewhere in the middle here, which uh, tells you that that vehicle stopped in there. That's actually when, when that vehicle got hit uh, and moved uh, all the way to the other place. So in our next steps, we're looking for more video acquisition and analysis, um, and then to do the safety assessment and suggested improvement strategies. Uh, our is currently doing that last step um, in, the, uh, in that framework. Uh, he's wrapping up his PhD, um, and that last step is about the safety assessment uh, and linking that to the su suggested improvement strategies and not just to stop there at the assessment. And then the model calibration and operation modeling and analysis. Um, the overall plan and the key points, um, the collaboration with the University of Khartoum, we wanted to access local knowledge and data, uh, provide our expertise and resources, uh, and of course, aiming to publish jointly. So this is the first work uh, we got from that collaboration uh, and we're showing it here for the first time uh, at the national conference. And then a capacity building and student monitor, uh, mentoring um, from Sudan. And then as a benefit to the, to the country itself to improve their safety and reduce congestion and help transform the country. As I said, they are moving into a new uh, democracy now and uh, uh, looking forward to our help. So that's my last slide, a journey of a thousand collaborations begins as a single step. And the best way uh, to predict the future is to create it. That's from Abraham Lincoln. Um, but that's, uh, I think that's what we are looking forward to do with, uh, with Sudan over there. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abbas. So um, if you have any questions, uh, would you please uh, raise your hand or um, uh, um, 
or actually you could just unmute and um, I can't necessarily see the whole room here. So um, I would suggest that you uh, just go, go ahead and uh, um, turn on your camera and unmute your microphone, ask a question. We have time for just a couple of questions before we move on to the next speaker. So let me just see if anybody has anything. Thank you. Uh, if someone is speaking, I can barely hear you. Okay, any, any questions? Okay, I, I have a question then. Um, yeah, so this was a very interesting presentation. I, I think this is a really important problem. Um, and I, and, and it's, I, there's a lot of work been done with this kind of thing with video detection and it's, and, and the camera location is a big issue. Um, but one of the things I noticed, you know, you talked about using some expectation about where the driver is going to go, where the vehicle is going to go based on the phase and the direction. So I, I have to imagine, given that this does happen, even in, in a Western country, in a developed country with somewhat um, ex strong expectations of driver behavior, I have to imagine in developing countries, not everybody does what they're supposed to do. So what about drivers who are kind of deviating from that? I mean, that doesn't help if there, anyone does that, does it? That's an, an actual, yeah, that's a really great question. And, and that's uh, what makes it interesting. That's, that's why I really wanted to, to do the video tracking rather than any other method so that we can mm -hmm. see uh, and track. So there is going to be a comparison between the predicted behavior and the actual behavior and the amount of deviation between the two. Uh, and that will be used for calibrating those models. So mm -hmm. we're looking forward to get more and more videos to analyze. I think that's going to be really interesting. Okay, good. Thank you. Does, does anyone else have any questions? Don't be shy. If you have a question, go ahead. All right. I guess there's no more questions. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abbas. We're... Um, Let's move on then to the next speaker. Um, this will, will be Shin Fu. Um, so Shin, go ahead and um, I believe you are set as a someone. Yeah, it looks like you're set as a co-host, so you can go ahead and start sharing. All right. Um, so, yeah, so Shin is a PhD candidate. Um, uh, at the University of Alabama, who majors in transportation. His supervisor is Dr. Jun Liu. Uh, Xing's research includes traffic safety, operational design for autonomous vehicles. So, and so uh, he's going to go ahead and uh, I'll let him go ahead and begin with the presentation. Once again, again, if you have any questions as you go, feel free to type them in the chat and we can bring them up at the end. Um, otherwise, let's stay muted and we will We'll have time for questions at the end. Thanks very much. And I'll, um, uh, Shin, go ahead and begin. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ivan. So my name is Xin Fu, and I'm currently a PhD student from the University of Alabama. So today I'm going to give you a brief introduction to one more research. So the research topic is from the past to the future, more in the temporary instability of the safety purpose functions. So first, uh, let me give you some brief introduction to research background. So let's start with some facts about the uh, crashes happening in Georgia. So from the history data, we could observe that there exists increasing trends in fatality total numbers and also the fatalities per mouse. So the uh, fatalities and the crashes have been critical issues for heavy safety. So there have been a lot of researchers and also practitioners trying to make the prediction for the number of crashes and uh, also come up with some kind of mirrors to elevate this kind of issue. So as for the prediction part, the safety performance function has been widely used for the agencies and also researchers to do the uh, crash number prediction. So the most uh, widely used function is the natural binomial model recommended by the heavy safety manual. So this equation is showing the showing the base form, base format of the safety performance function. So we could check that on the left hand side that we are going to predict as a number of crashes, and on the right hand side we are going to impose the model with some like features like annual uh, average annual uh, tra traffic uh, 
uh, daily traffic and also like the percent day grade or curve radius, all these kind of features. So this model is super, uh, the, the natural binomial model is uh, easy to develop and to build and also to use. And the, it, it is the, uh, it could intuitively expand the price quality and also help to come up with uh, some errors. But actually this kind of simple model, there could be some disadvantages. So this kind of model cannot represent the temporal instability, cannot address this kind of temporal instabilities. That means we could imagine that when we are building the safety performance function model, we are using the historical data to build up the model. But actually, we are using this kind of model for prediction. But we can imagine that. So this kind of model is based on all the historical data. That means the, the parameters esti estimated for the model, it could only represent the, the average safety performance of the past. If we are using this kind of model to make the prediction for the future, there could be some issue. So to address this kind of issue, we can check the figure on the right. So imagine that, oh, sorry. Imagine that the parameters of the safety perform functions, it would not be stable all the time. It could be a curve like the red line here. It could be increasing or decreasing, but we don't know. But when we are building the using the traditional way to build up the safety problem function, we use all the historical data and then came up with the fixed parameters in the model. It's just like a horizontal line across all the time. So we could find that there could be difference between the real, maybe the real performance parameter, uh, real function parameters and the parameter we estimate. estimate. So here comes the research question that how could we address this kind of temporary stability in the SPF model? So here comes our solution. So we are trying to propose a concept like the future safety performance function. So it's just defined as the crash predictive model that with the parameter that can represent the relationship between the factors in the future. To be short, uh, it could be simplified as the, we are going to make the prediction on the parameters or the coefficients in the model itself instead of the number of crashes. So we are going to use this kind of framework to capture the and account for the temporal variations. And the, as for the framework, it will constitute with two parts. The first part is the temporal modeling, and we are going to use it to, to uncover the temporal variations. And for the second part, we use the time of series analysis to make the prediction for the future SPF parameters. So here comes the research question we are going to address in this research. So the first question is that, how could we reveal the temporal instability in the SPF functions? So there have been some research like the random parameters and also micro chain to, unre uh, uh, to reveal this kind of pattern. The second question is that uh, how the trends of the parameter look like or the coefficient look like. Is it increasing across time or it is decreasing? We don't know. We want to figure out. And the third research question is that what kind of what kind of method to use to make the prediction for the SPF coefficients? So based on the future SPF framework we developed, so here we have solutions for each question. So for the first question, instead of using the random parameter or, or this, that kind of model, we just uh, extend the current negative binomial, binomial model to make it uh, to address the temporal weight. And for the second question, we are going to use the time series analysis to uh, figure out uh, the trends and also some other temporal patterns of the coefficients. And for the third question, we are trying to use like the SRA model or artificial neural network to make the short prediction, short time prediction. So here, this figure showing the overall working flow of our, of our methodology. So the first, the first step, we're going to prepare the data for the modeling. And second step, we're going to apply the temporal negative binomial, binomial model and the develop a series models. And the third step, we're going to plot all the coefficients of the models and see if there exists some like a temporal trend and do the time series analysis. 
and the first, for the first step, we are going to make the prediction. So here I'm, I'm going to address more as the data pre preparation process. So in this study, we aggregate the crisis data every 12 months, and uh, we are every uh, for and we every time we just move a mouse forward to aggregate the data for next model. So here is a here just an instance. So for for the first group, we just aggregate data from the January to next January, and for at for the second group, we aggregate data starting from the February to next February. And after all this kind of like rolling process, we could aggregate the data for the temporal modeling. And also this kind of method could uh, um, capture this kind of temporal variation. So as for the temporal modeling, so we just uh, give different ways to different observations. So for instance, if the counter analysis time step is January, so the uh, observations from the October will be less weighted, but the observation from the February will be highly weighted. So for more details, I will be I will discuss it later. So the case study, we 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 have a case study using the Georgia Georgia DOT crash data. So the data that we used was collected from between the 2013 to 2018, and in total there were there were 30,694 crashes collected over on 1,176 non traversable segments. And as for the features selected in the SPF function, we selected the ADT, the segment length, and also the access point density as the features. So these two figures are showing the overall um, spatial distribution of the segments we are analyzing and also the number of crashes. So this table is showing the overall, um, overall data description for the model. So, the temporal weighted safety performance, as we discussed before, so it's just based on the general format of the SPF. But for different observations, we give it different uh, different temporal weights. And in terms of the prediction, here we use the uh, two models. The first model is the signal auto regressive integrated moving average. It is a very popular time series model for the short time period prediction. And then we also use the artificial neural network. So this network is uh, very simple. We just uh, use the three layer network, the input layer with the hidden layer and also the final layer. So uh, after aggregating the data and, uh, more, uh, and build up the uh, temporal weighted uh, negative binomial model, uh, this table is showing the model results. So from the model result, we could find that there exists the significant uh, variations for the coefficients. So for instance, for the ADT, we could find that the coefficient could vary from 0 0.86 to 0 0.98. So for more details, we just plot all the models we developed and uh, just plot all the coefficients for different features and trying to find out the temporal patterns. So here we just decompose the coefficients into the trends and the seasonality. So for the ADT and the segment lens, we could observe there would be increasing trends according to time. As for the access point density, there was a decrease in trends. So that means for the same amount of ADT, for the same amount of ADT, it will increase, it will cause more crashes than the past. So we also check the seasonalities within a year. So from this figure, we could find that the impacts of the ADT and segment length will be increasing starting the of, uh, January and increasing, increasing to the peak at around June. And after that, the impact will decrease. Uh, in comparison, the access point density, the peak of Access point this day is showing up at around October. So, based on the time series results, we are going to build up the uh, prediction models to, to predict the coefficients in the SPF functions. 
So we have tried the different combination of the parameters in the SLRAM model and also ANN and, and uh, select the model with the best of, with the least AIC and BIC. So from the model result, we could find that the SLRAM model has a good fit to the historical data and the mean, mean square error and the uh, mean percentage error is controlled to a low level. So this figure is showing the um, a prediction results of the fit, fit results of the artificial neural network. So this kind of artificial neural network even have better performance than the SLRIMA with even less error. So both of the models show the good fit to the historical data. So here comes the discussion part. So with the future SPF function framework, we are going to address two points. So the first point is that we are going to use this form framework to address the temporal heterogeneities existing in the safety proper functions, also the crash data. So based on this framework, we are able to uncover the uh, uncover the temporal features of the uh, temporal patterns of the features. We could figure out that there exists the ascending and also possible distant trains for the impacts of the features. And also, we also find that there exists synergy, synergy within a year. In terms of the, from the practical aspect, the agencies or the practitioners, they could use kind of this kind of uh, SRE model or AI models to make the predictions for the coefficients in the SPF. That means they could use kind of this model to just uh, uh, come up with the SPF function that could, could more accurately make the prediction. So here are the major conclusions and the takeaways. So with our framework, we confirm that the, there exists significant temporal instability continues throughout the time. And second, the time series models could capture the temporal instability and also the variation of the coefficients. And the third is that our method is developed just based on the natural binomial model, so which is, which is frequently used by the agencies. And it is easy for them to just extend the current natural binomial to the future SPF and to um, make the short prediction for the function coefficients. Okay, uh, that's all of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Thank you, Xing. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Please go ahead and uh, unmute and um, uh, please, uh, I have a quick right. question. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of your tables showed the AIC BIC values uh, for four variables, and that seems to me like each variable was its own model, right? Was was in its own model. Um, so I'm just curious why or whether you looked at combining these values, or, or are you reporting? Are you trying to report AIC BIC values just for the variable within the? Uh, you know, uh, aggregate model. I'm, I was a little confused. Uh, I'm not quite. I just uh, because the for the SRA model, there is not a very standard like the how you select the different parameters for the modeling. So you could set up like the auto, uh, what is called the auto regressive factor or this kind of factors. You have decided how many, how much data you have. You are going to evolve in the uh, modeling. So the AICBIC just works like the comparing of the different models. Here, I just uh, have it here, just uh, showing that um, we just uh, compare the different AIC and BIC from different combination of the parameters for the SRA model. And we just select the ones that with the least value. So that, that, uh, so that means the model has, uh, are using the, um, um, I think using the least uh, pr least uh, inputs to have a better performance in prediction. So that's why I have it here. Uh, seeing, I think there may be a need a little color, color, clarification. It's like those variables are not X variables. Those are dependent variables. Those are Y. We are predicting the intercept. So we are predicting the AD parameter. We are predicting the parameter for segment length. Okay. 
So that's not the independent variables in the, in the model. They are in four separate models. Oops. Okay, that clarifies it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was uh, was there any um, you know did you try to have one um, Sarima model or a, an artificial neural network for all of them together? And that's the next step. I, I think you... that's a that's a that's a great challenge. And if you want to have one one model to predict four values, uh, I think it's maybe it's doable for uh, currently, but we, we haven't thought about that. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, well, I have, I have a question. So, something I was a little bit confused about is that mm -hmm. it appears that your data sets that you used for estimating each of the monthly models, it wasn't actually a model using data just for that month. It's It was actually 12 months. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So it's just a rolling 12 months. So it's unclear to me since that should be a full year of data, which would have the full seasonality going through the whole 12 months. It seems like there shouldn't be any monthly seasonality in the results. Um, the only thing it would be is that it's a later period in time, which wouldn't necessarily be something that's repeating every year. It's just something that would be maybe uh, changing over time time and you're just able to capture that increment in the change in the coefficients on a monthly basis instead of waiting for a year to see what's changed. So I'm confused about why there's a seasonality in this because you're, you know, by doing it over 12 months, you should be aggregating out all of the seasonality changes. Yeah. So I'm a little bit confused about what's going on. Yeah, those you just uh, raised a very important issue here. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I mean, I don't have a good explanation for that, actually, but I'm just, uh, I mean, thinking of the traffic volume. The traffic volume in the model is just one ADT value, but you know that uh, there is a seasonality, uh, var uh, seasonal variation in there. Uh, so, so how did you get the ADTs then? Was it ADT over the 12 months that you, over these different 12 months? It's so you did it. You had a monthly eighty. You had a monthly volume that, that were added up. Is that what you're saying? It's not monthly volume. It's like just a two year volume. We just uh, combine them by the proportion of the time within each year. Um, so okay. So so was the volume? So for those months that were for one month to the next, like going from twelve, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which you're showing, is there going to be a different ADT on each one of those models? A slightly different. Because mm -hmm. it's going to be based on the actual 12 months that you have. Is that correct? That's yeah. right. Okay, so I could see some variation there because the volume, but then that would just be affecting the volume. I, it's, it's hard for me to understand what seasonal variation in the coefficient should be picked up because you should be accommodating that by having a whole 12, 12 months. It's just that it's a different beginning and end of the 12 months. So it still should get all that get that interest i mean that would have been interesting if you did find out like how things were changing by the month but um i so i'm just really kind of confused about why that's going on yeah that's uh i think we are also on the same page of doing that trying to figure out why we see those variations uh it's uh, somehow we haven't found a good explanation to explain uh we just this is just the data driven and it's uncovered based on the data so I think the one thing that this, by doing it this way, one of the things you can do is find out how it's changing incrementally rather than just getting a big step every year. And so that helps you to get the more data points to see how things are changing. But even so, it just seems, uh, it just seems it's, it's just a little, it's a little puzzling to me about what, you know, since it seems like you shouldn't have any seasonal variation other than, the, than what comes up with the volume. Um, anyone else have any questions? Um, so one other question I'm thinking, I, I was just going to ask one more thing is that it, it seems that those, you know, with any, whenever you see this temporal instability, it seems there would be two different kinds. One would be seasonal, which we just talked about. And the other is the time trend, how it's changing over time. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, 
it seems like you were count accommodating those. The setup seems to be it's better to get the time trend. But I'm wondering, how would this be different from using time indicators with interactions in the model? How would this be different than just doing something like that? Um, well, for just revealing the variation, I think there is no, I mean, significant difference. But uh, if we talk about the, uh, what Sandy we talk about, the predicting the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the future, uh, mm -hmm. then we, we, we may have to, I mean, know what's the, uh, what's the relationship between the, those parameters and the time. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Sure, that makes sense. That makes sense. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I just have something uh, just come up in my mind is about this uh, seasonal variation. Uh, I'm I'm just I'm not sure about that, but probably Shin can figure it out. I mean, the time series model they just decompose the whole variation, put it to the time chain and also the seasonal trend. I mean, maybe somehow the time series model they always want to extract the seasonal train, seasonal variation, and probably there is no good explanation to explain it. Uh, I mean, so we think about that. Okay, I right, well, thank you. Thank you. All right, so I guess if there's no other questions, we can, um, we got a little bit, we're a little bit ahead of time now. So thank you very much for, for uh, keeping it moving there. Um, the next presentation is actually one that I'm a co-author on and the speaker is supposed to be Pankaj Joshi, who is not able to, uh, who's not able to do this due to a work commitment. So let me find the file here and I'm going to go ahead and, and do this present and share this presentation. Um, and I'm going to, I'm not used to, believe it or not, I don't usually use Zoom. I usually use um, Teams or WebEx at our university. And so I have to figure out how I'm gonna do, see how this works in Zoom. Um, so, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share, he recorded the presentation, I'm gonna share that. And that's another thing that's a new thing for me. So bear with me as I go here. I'm gonna start sharing. Um, Okay, I'm sorry, I don't think I was sharing. I'm gonna restart this because I don't think it was sharing by, uh, it wasn't sharing the sound. So let me, I'm gonna start this over again. Um, Hello everyone. Um, Welcome and thank you for being here. The topic of my research today is effect of traffic conflicts on pedestrian crossing volume considering geospatial and other location data. Talking about importance of walking as a travel mode, walking has been known as an essential for reducing auto dependency with the known effects and GIZ emission footprint of auto on environment. Walking has also been promoted when people have been encouraged to walk more with known benefits of uh, walking on personal health. Researchers have also found that people that arrive by walking are more competitive consumers than those that arrive by other modes such as cars. With such known benefits of walking on different sectors, Increasing share of walking has been prioritized and emphasized by urban agencies. Active transportation program by Caltrans aims to double the share of walking. And on the right, you can see a plot of total obligations to pedestrians and bicycle facilities and programs by air by FSWA. And we can see an increasing trend and we can expect a lot of more investments in these sectors, in these uh, pedestrian facilities to encourage people to walk more. Hence, to, share, to ensure that these benefits are used efficiently and in the right way, we need to know what factors affect walking. Hence, the objective and hypothesis of this study is that the, the primary goal of this research is that the conflicts 
uh, between pedestrian and vehicle contribute to the variation in pedestrian volume and crosswalks under the assumption that conflicts are influential on pedestrians' perception of safety. While exploring this hypothesis, the secondary goal of the study is to explore the uh, geospatial land use and issued network characteristics that influence pedestrian volume. The data that has been used in this study can be uh, divided into two sectors. The first one are traffic conflicts. Uh, three previous studies uh, observed the interactions between uh, pedestrians and vehicles at different crossing locations and classified them following a modified version of Swedish traffic conflict technique. In these three studies, across three studies, there are a total of 116 crosswalks located in 206 different intersections and mid-block locations in 25 towns in Connecticut. On the right, you can see uh, the map of the Connecticut, the blue, blue polygons are the towns where the um, crossing locations uh, were located. The modified version of Swedish traffic conflict technique classifies the interactions between pedestrian and um, vehicle into four categories. The first one is undisturbed crossing. In this type of crossing, the pedestrian crosses the road when there are no vehicles in the vicinity or all vehicles are already completely stopped while the pedestrian begins to cross. And this kind of, these types of interactions do not present any kind of threat to pedestrians. Then comes potential conflict where simple interactions such as eye contact between the pedestrian and vehicle driver as the vehicle decelerates the stop are present. And these kinds of potential do not present any threat to pedestrian as well. The minor conflict are those where uh, speed of the vehicle is low and it makes a quick stop a few steps away from the pedestrian at a crosswalk to avoid hitting the pedestrian in the crosswalk. Uh, there is a low possibility of uh, these kinds of interactions to become a collision and are unlikely to result in fatality or serious injury if it, if it were to become a collision. Severe conflicts are those where a very late evasive action to avoid a collision taken by a vehicle driver, such as unusual uh, deceleration or abrupt stopping, or by pedestrians, such as jumping back onto sidewalk or running out of vehicle's path. Uh, these kinds of conflicts are likely to result in fatality or serious injury in the absence of evasive action. This table presents the summary statistics from the traffic conflict observations across three studies. Um, the, as is presented here, the interactions are classified into four different categories. Uh, we have vehicular volume of uh, at these crossing, crossing locations as well. The observed hour varied from one hour to six hour across three studies because uh, the, the lower uh, observation hours in the studies were because of the adverse conditions such as weather, uh, rain and other uh, and other kinds of factors uh, which made the observation uh, not possible. Another type of data that is used in this study are geospatial, which include parcel level land use type data and street network characteristics. Um, for this, uh, for this street network from OpenStreetMap was used. Uh, on the right, you can see an example cross, an example map with uh, example crosswalk locations in Hartford. The uh, black dots are the crossing locations, and and other are, and the lines are the streets. Using the street network from OpenStreetMap, uh, service area polygons were uh, generated using network analyst tool in ArcGIS. Um, to generate these service area polygons, three threshold distances were used: um, one eighth of a mile, quarter mile, and half mile. Uh, these threshold distances were used uh, with an assumption that people usually walk to destinations that are uh, within these distances. Uh, these polygons were used to generate land use and network characteristics in the vicinity of each crossing locations at three different uh, geographical scale. To categorize the land use type in each in the parcels in the vicinity of crossing location, uh, nine categories were used in the study. Um, there were a different classification system that we received from the uh, from the different towns for their parcels. And in order to make it consistent, uh, these nine categories were used, which included single family residential, multifamily residential, major commercial, industrial, uh, office and minor commercial, which included uh, government buildings, banks, and commercial places, such as fast food franchises, restaurants, uh, institutional included churches, religious institutions, institutions, uh, hospitals, etc. 
Parking included parcels and buildings that were used for parking. Uh, parks and recreation uh, included public parks and recreational places. Higher educational included colleges and universities. These are the summary statistics uh, for the geospatial ge ge variables uh, extracted using the Hartman polygon. Um, so we have a parcel area for each type of land is type in, inside that polygon. Uh, we used average block length as the representation of network connect street network connectivity uh, in that area. The interactions between pedestrian and vehicles have a potential to represent how pedestrians perceive safety at a crossing location. For that, uh, we have used a term, contact ratio, which is uh, determined by uh, taking a ratio of number of highly severe interactions to number of least severe interactions, where highly severe interactions include minor and severe conflicts as defined earlier, and less severe interactions include potential conflicts and undisturbed crossings as defined earlier. This categorization is based on the discomfort and uh, likelihood of causing injury if they were to become a collision um, and hence their severity. Uh, the, the model formulation that we use for this analysis are, is log linear regression. Um, we looked at the distribution of the pedestrian volume and we found that uh, the log of the pedestrian volume followed the normal distribution and, and, and took log linear regression as the uh, appropriate model form for this uh, purpose. Here, PI is the pedestrian crossing volume at per hour at location I, uh, XI is the contact ratio, um, WI is a vector of geospatial variables at location I, beta 1 and beta 2 are the parameters to be estimated and epsilon i is the random disturbance for the location i. In the data that we have, there are 206 unique locations with one to four crosswalks. These crosswalks at the same intersections uh, have a possibility of sharing the same characteristics of the intersection such as demographic and as well as the crime history. And the geospatial variables in for that for the crosswalks at that intersection are very similar that's why uh, these the observations at different crosswalks may act like the same observations of the intersection so in order to address that this issue uh, we added an intersection specific random effect term uh, which is represented by delta j in this equation uh, which is similar to the equation previously but uh, with an addition of the intersection specific random effect this is also uh, known as random uh, effect model. Um, after uh, implementing the random effect model, we explored the spatial autocorrelation between uh, the different locations uh, in the close vicinity. Uh, we ran the Morensi statistic of on the residuals of the model, and we found that the statistic is close to zero and is statistically insignificant at 10% significance level. After that, we plotted the residuals especially as well in order to uh, get a visual confirmation. Uh, and the special plot actually showed two possible clustering in two towns, Hartford and West Hartford. After looking at the, uh, the exploring or examining the location of these uh, crosswalks, we found that these crosswalks are in the downtown of these two towns. Therefore, two dichotomous variables representing whether the location is in these two downtown areas or not in, was included in the model. Uh, the the other the added newly added variables are U J and V J, which uh, represent indicate whether the intersection J is located in downtown Hartford and West Hartford respectively, and beta three and beta four are the parameters to be determined for these variables. Uh, the residuals from this model were also checked for special uh, correlation using Warren's size statistic, which was determined to be zero and insignificant at 10% significance level. After that, the uh, residuals were again especially plotted, and this time it was uh, seen that the possible clustering was not present anymore. Now, showing you the result, uh, we carried out the modeling at three geographical scale: uh, one of a mile, quarter mile, and half mile. For each geographical scale, we did the modeling at four steps. Model one included the geospatial and issued network characteristics. Uh, Model two included traffic volume and with the variables that were significant in model one. Model three included conflict ratio with the variables that were significant in model one and model four included all of these. This was done to find out the significance and contribution of these 
uh, variables to model fit. As the representation of the model fit, AIC and log likelihood are presented here at the bottom. Looking at this, we can say that the model four is the best, where we found that the uh, variables of interest conflict ratio is significant and negatively associated with pedestrian volume, indicating that the intersection or crossing locations, which have higher conflict ratio, um, absorbs lower pedestrian volume. Uh, traffic volume is found to be positively associated. Uh, single family is negatively associated. Higher educational, which includes colleges and university, is positively associated. The dummy variables that indicate whether the location is hard, in Hartford downtown and West Hartford downtown is found to be significant and positively associated. From this result, from the, looking at the best model, which is model four, uh, it is exp the expected decrease in the pedestrian volume with uh, 1% increase in conflict ratio is about 0 0.04 to 5 times the pedestrian volume. Um, these are the results from the modeling process done for quarter mile buffer. The modeling process includes the same for, uh, for models for one geographic scale. Uh, and looking at the model fit, which is AIC and log likelihood, we can say that the model 8 is the best one. From where we can say that the conflict ratio is again significant and uh, negatively associated with pedestrian volume um, in this model as well. Uh, traffic volume is also found significant and positively associated. Single family, uh, higher educational, Hartford downtown and West Hartford downtown are still significant. The two new variables, office and minor commercial and industrial, are significant at this geographical scale. The officer minor commercials are positively associated with pedestrian volume, whereas having higher industrial uh, parcels in the vicinity results into less pedestrian volume. From this model, we can say that uh, with uh, the increase in 0 0.01 or 1% 1 of conflict ratio, uh, the expected decrease in pedestrian volume is 0 0.04 times the pedestrian volume. Um, Models using, these are the results from the models uh, that were generated for half mile buffer. Uh, the modeling process again follows the same process. Um, from the AIC and log likelihood, we can say that the model 12 here is the best one. Uh, from where the model, the variable of interest conflict ratio is still significant and negatively associated with pedestrian volume. Uh, the traffic volume, single family, um, Officer minor commercial, higher educational, Hartford and West Hartford down variables are significant here as well. The new variables that are that are new here are the um, multifamily parcels, which is possibly associated, which makes sense because having uh, have multifamily parcels or uh, parcels in the vicinity means um, you know higher density of population, resulting into higher population volume. We have. Um, we also have average block length here, representation of the uh, street network connectivity significant in half mile buffer, which has a negative coefficient, meaning that if uh, the average block length in the vicinity is, is higher, we the pedestrian volume goes down. Uh, from this model, we can say that with 1% increase in pedestrian volume, uh, the expected decrease in pedestrian volume is about 4.15%. This slide summarizes the results of the modeling uh, in this table. The brown cells represent a negative estimate, uh, green cell represent a positive estimate, and gray cell represents not significant. From this table, we can see that conflict ratio is significant in all three models and negatively associated with pedestrian volume, which is what we expected. Uh, conflict ratio represents a discomfort of the interactions, hence with two crossing locations having same geospatial and other variables uh, constant, the crossing location with higher conflict ratio rubs up low pedestrian volume. Um, traffic volume is found to be positively associated. Single family is also, also found to be significant in all three geographical scale and negatively associated with pedestrian volume. However, multifamily is significant in half mile buffer only and positively associated. This might be because single family parcels um, contain less population density than multifamily and having a higher uh, square footage of multifamily in the vicinity results into higher pedestrian volume. Uh, major commercial and officer minor commercials are positively associated to pedestrian volume. Uh, these uh, land use types can included uh, banks, government buildings, restaurants, uh, food chains, which uh, attract pedestrians. Industrial is found to be significant in quarter mile buffer only and negatively associated. Uh, higher educational is found to be significant in all three geographical scale and positively associated. Average block length is found to be negatively associated at uh, half mile 
a buffer. Um, this is also what unexpected because having higher block length means less connectivity and hence uh, less options for people to walk. The dummy variable Hartford Downtown and West Hartford Downtown are found to be uh, positively associated and significant in all three geographical scale. This represented uh, that uh, with absence of these variables in the model, the model would underestimate the pedestrian volume at these locations. So as a conclusion, um, we found that there is a significant association between pedestrian volume and conflict ratio, uh, which indicated that 1% increase in conflict ratio can result into about 4% reduction in pedestrian volume. Uh, therefore, it is recommended that the accommodation of pedestrians at crossing locations should be given proper consideration while designing planning land use and designing pedestrian friendly street networks with adequate solutions at road crossing locations to make interactions with vehicles safe and comfortable it can help the planners to achieve their environmental societal and economic goals by promoting walking um, there are some limitations of this study uh, one of those is that all of these crosswalk locations are all located in Con Connecticut. So if any cultural and behavioral differences in other places might play a role in the relationship. Um, we also, the method that was used for to observe the interactions was, was, a, was a modified uh, switch traffic on the technique. So using a different procedure and classifying a different methodology might result in a different finding as well. Uh, one of the factors here is that the traffic conflict observation time actually varied for different locations due to adverse weather conditions, absence of pedestrians, and etc. And all observations were carried out during the daytime. Um, and with that, I want to acknowledge Vincent Wang for his help in uh, land use data collection and uh, data preparation. Uh, Towns of Hartford, Waterbury, and Antonia for providing their personal level uh, land use data and Center for Advanced Multimodal Mobility Solutions at Education KMC at University of North Carolina Charlotte for uh, funding and assistance in the research. And with that, I conclude my presentation here. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, sorry, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, I muted my my headset. <laughs> um, so yeah, I hope that worked for everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I neglected to introduce Pankaj at the beginning. He got his master's degree at University of Connecticut. Previously, he, uh, uh, I don't remember, remember the name of his university at, in Nepal, where he got his bachelor's degree, and he's now a planner at Fresno Council of Governments. Anyway, um, so does anyone have any questions? I'm hoping to see... Okay, I see some questions already here. Um, okay, so Ron's question about the locations being urban and rural. Uh, these were primarily urban-ish locations. So they were not on like rural roads, but some of these towns, they were mostly all at least suburban type towns. So it wasn't a completely rural area, if that answers your question. Um, does that answer your question, Ron? I, I just allowed everyone to unmute yourself. Yes, it does. Thank you. Because I okay, was good. curious, you know, suburban yeah. versus urban. Rural, yeah. So, yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. And so as you saw that the dummy for downtown was the only we did, like we checked the spatial autocorrelation. And that was a very big difference because there's a lot more pedestrians there. Um, and so Yan Tao has a question. I'm curious whether the conflicts are also related to the vehicle types and sizes. Uh, we didn't notice the vehicle types. We didn't get that in the type of col in the type of um, conflict. Sorry. Um, any other questions? Um, I think one thing I wanted to mention is the or something I was thinking about as the presentation was going. I neglected to write it down. Um, I. So the, yeah, there were three different studies that were done over several years. Um, one of the things that we did not get was some of the, we didn't get the, the things that you just you guys were just asking about, and also um, 
there, there's different time periods. I, I know what I was thinking about. So the daytime conflicts could obviously be quite different at night. And so the, we did this during the daytime because it was easier for, for observation purposes, of course. But And it's also when we felt there was going to be the most activities. That's why we looked at those locations. And the data were actually collected for studies that were looking at specifically looking at safety in those conflicts. And when we decided we thought this would be another way to use the data to just turn it around the other way and to see if the actual volumes are related to these conflicts. And so we were very happy to see that that, 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 that was actually a good uh, outcome, uh, actually a, a correct uh, expectation. All right, any other questions? All right, let's move on to the next speaker then. I'll get my notes back up here. So our last speaker is Krishnamurthy Guramurthy. Um, um, he is a computational transportation engineer at the Argonne National Laboratory. He received his doctorate for his extensive work on shared autonomous vehicle forecasts and holds two masters in civil engineering and statistics from UT Austin. He earned his bachelor's in civil engineering from the National Institute of Technology, Karnataka in in India, his research focuses on travel demand modeling and forecasting through large scale simulations, but is also interested in estimating statistical models using various varying data sets. And I'll go ahead and let uh, Dr. Gurumurthy begin. Thank you, John. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so yeah, today uh, I will be talking about how uh, we model low animal vehicle crash counts across large networks. And this is a little bit of a shift from we heard, you know, vehicle vehicle conflicts, we heard pedestrian vehicle conflicts. So it's a little bit of a shift and I'll be talking about animal vehicle crashes. So this was done when I was still at UT Austin uh, with Tara Kockelman and collaborators Zilli Lee and Pratik Bansal. Um, feel free to stop me in between if you have questions, I'm okay with that, just letting you guys know. Um, so yeah, we uh, focus on Texas for this study and we had data for all the animal vehicle collisions in Texas, as well as the road network. As you can see, uh, you know, there are, there are some uh, clustering effects uh, near the urban area edges. There are several hotspots in San Antonio, Southeast uh, border with Mexico, and then in Tyler, Texas. So it was just interesting that we had this much data. And the key question we wanted to answer was how um, traffic and design conditions affect these counts and especially so across uh, a really large network like these 120,000 plus links. Another dimension to this is how can we reflect seasonality? As you can see each year, there have been about 6,000 animal vehicle collisions reported, and this is increasing year on year. Um, and more importantly, when you look at it month to month, there is a clear peaking in October to December uh, which could be from the mating season, uh, could be from migration and difference in rainfall or temperature. Uh, and we want to capture this variation. Something that's not reflected in this data set is how these counts vary by time of day. There could be more crashes early in the day or late at night. And we, um, you know, that's something we have not been able to capture here, but it's also interesting. Another you know, key challenge with um, animal vehicle collisions, especially when it comes to these large networks, is that most segments have zero animal vehicle collisions. As you can see, it's uh, severely zero inflated. So how do we do this in a large scale model and still accommodate these zeros? Um, and then when, when, we, when we wanna explain these counts, once we have potentially, um, you know, we can always put on parametric approaches and, and get information on the distributions, but how do we explain it with these uh, currently unobserved heterogeneity um, with factors like fencing or water sources in addition to just the segment level information? Um, and that was the key goal of the study. Um, to do that, we model these animal vehicle counts with the binomial distribution, slightly different from a typical count modeling approach. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. So we model the number of animal vehicle collisions as a binomial with parameters N and P. Um, the N for us is a segment specific, month specific exposure variable, which we call number of animal crossings. And this is distributed as a Dirichlet process prior. And what that gives us is a clustering so that we can accommodate these zero counts as one cluster and 
you know, several other clusters can have greater than zero or non-zero um, average counts, um, which will help us isolate these two clusters and, and help us fit um, our probability um, of, of crashes uh, in each of these segments and months, which is the second part. Um, so we did that again based on a logistic function. And because the binomial distribution does not have a conjugate prior, we applied uh, Paulson et al.'s data augmentation process, which some of you might be familiar with uh, if, you've, if you've done any uh, Bayesian work. Uh, and along with that, we did some metropolis hasting sampling in order to arrive at the final exposure NST. Um, and then we use these augmented model, uh, data, uh, augmented variables, which are polygamma distributed variables, to transform the binomial likelihood into the Gaussian likelihood, which works well when we want to do MCMC or Markov chain Monte Carlo processes. So the full model is presented here. It's a two block model. Um, we have the exposure, we have the crash probability. Um, like I mentioned, the exposure model is a Dirichlet process. Um, we get the continuous N star ST uh, from each of these clusters which follow a normal distribution. So we have cluster specific means and standard deviations, and then we truncate it to get NST. And the other side, we have the crash probability but we have time varying QTs as a prior, um, you know, which is a beta prior, and an indicator variable IST, which is segment and month specific again, to give us any remaining unobserved heterogeneity apart from all that we have included, which together form uh, the probability of crash uh, through, through the logistic. Um, and, and finally, KST is our animal vehicle crashes, which is, uh, brings together these two parameters that we're modeling in a hierarchical framework. Um, so the, the variables that go into the probabilities could be things like, um, you know, segment specific variables like speed limit, surface width. Um, we have some peak factor variables and average daily traffic variables as well. And, and some time varying factors uh, like rainfall, which is considered in this model, but we could also go deeper and look at temperature and, and other values, uh, which are averages by month and, and associate that with these segments as well. The indicators um, and the time varying parameters enable a segment and month specific heterogeneity in these probabilities. So that, um, you know, we'll show you soon um, the different structures, different distributions we get because of allowing this, this variation. So like I mentioned, there's a two block approach. We, uh, our algorithm is mainly comprised of two steps. After initialization, um, we draw the NST or the animal number of animal crossings using the metropolis pasting step. Uh, like a, it's, it's based on the Dirichlet process prior. So each of these cluster IDs were, um, each of these segment month pairs were assigned a cluster ID. Um, and we use a multinomial distribution uh, to obtain what the segment specific parameters for each time period are. Um, the cluster weights are then updated using a stick breaking construction because you know these are all clusters. Uh, we know that they're digitally prior. And if you look at the literature, the stick breaking construction with betas allows us to make sure that all groups uh, add up to one uh, in probability and, and gives us a distribution that we can rely on. And Finally, the conversion of the trunk, uh, conversion of the continuous NST star is done to get uh, the final NST, which is uh, the animal crossings. This end of the step, step 1F, um, ties together with step 2 in accommodating the weighted probability for the cluster and the binomial of KST given NST PST um, so that we can perform the metropolis hasting steps. Um, and this is, this is the key step that brings uh, the two steps together. Uh, the second step for the second block is drawing the PST. Uh, we mentioned the poly or gamma uh, distributed variable. So we draw auxiliary variables, omega ST based on Paulson et al. Um, so that we can assign finite parameters through these uh, omega ST for a given NST, which is animal crossings. Um, and so, after this transformation, we can draw the betas and the gammas and the alphas from a multivariate normal, and we can fit these uh, for the number of animal crossings we figured out. And this along with uh, accommodating the indicator for unobserved heterogeneity 
uh, will give us the final PSD uh, in its logistic from, from the logistical transformation. Uh, this is some information on the data that went behind uh, the model. So we have segment uh, several, like 120,000 segments. So the average length is about uh, 0.6 or 0.7 miles, uh, but with um, you know a wide distribution with some uh, segments just connecting and some as long as 30 miles. And, and the length is very important because it's a exposure variable because length in itself for a road does not necessarily transform into, um, it, it is very important for the number of uh, crashes, but it's more important as an exposure because we want to control for it because uh, in, in terms of associating a crash to a segment, the, the length has no meaning uh, in itself. Uh, and then you see the average daily traffic variables. Most of these variables are distributed really well. Um, and, and posted speed limit goes on up until 85. I think uh, the fastest roadway in, in the US is in Austin. So that's 85 miles per hour. And you can see that 29% of all our uh, network segments is in the urban area. Or, or close to uh, some major region or some major city. Um, then we move on to how we obtain uh, the posterior draws for these uh, for this Bayesian model. Um, so we use the Markov chain Monte Carlo method, like I mentioned. Um, after burning 10,000 draws, we store 10,000 values, and we also pre-decide three clusters. I mentioned the Dirichlet process. So after testing several uh, prior values um, for the cluster means, we decided to go with three clusters that gave the best, um, you know, out, uh, best prediction. So there were three clusters with mean zero, four, and eight crossings. And uh, this was able, this, this helped us get our unbiased sample. Um, it was all coded in R and it, it took about 24 hours in, in a pretty fast computer to uh, sample. So it is, it is quite computationally intensive, uh, but it's still, uh, you know, for, for such a large model, it's still not too much time. Um, the Gelman and Rubin convergence diagnostic or the hard hat diagnostic lets us know how much uh, we have converged when we're drawing these, uh, when we're making these random draws. So we got a value of 1.011, which is really close to one, um, which, which verifies convergence. What this means is that every draw um, is random enough that it creates an unbiased or uncorrelated uh, posterior sample, which is very important um, to make inference from this, uh, this sample. The trace plots for a few key variables are also shown. And the worm like structure is, again, a factor of, um, is a, another confirmation um, similar to the r hat diagnostic of 1.011, uh, which shows the uncorrelated draws. And we had assumed normal distribution for these variables, and, and that is what we have uh, obtained, which is uh, confirming our hypothesis again. So in terms of the results, um, fewer than 1.5% of the segments had animal crossing. So we were able to get that zero inflation uh, accounted for. Uh, you see uh, all the highlighted variables on the right have are within the 95% credible interval because this is Bayesian modeling. Um, and once we're, we are accounting for the segment length as an exposure, we can see that if you know controlled access freeways decrease the probability of a crash, um, the presence of trees uh, or relative to water open and buildings increases the, um, the, the probability of a crash. And you know, more traffic in the peak period, there is some decrease again in, in the probability. And it, all these can be made with, uh, with some conviction because of the statistical significance. And among all of the segments in, in, you know, in the post prediction step, about 50% have a notably higher risk of having ABCs. And, and to summarize, you know, higher speed limits, more rural settings, wider roadways, and the presence of water and lack of median are all factors that increase the crash likelihood. Uh, in, in terms of the time varying component, uh, the constant random effect that we added, uh, we can see that it varies in effect uh, depending on the month. Um, so the rainfall effect is, the, is most prominent in April, uh, but you can also see the highlighted uh, October to December months is when the mating season uh, happens. So that's 
also associated with that higher significant um, crash probability. We plotted what we predicted with our model um, against the observed data and we predict the seasonality quite well. As you can see, we uh, get that distribution I showed maybe on slide two um, for October, November, December, which is pretty high compared to uh, the first few months. The PST or the craft property is segment and time uh, specific. So we can see that when you fix time for January and October, we see the differing uh, distribution here of, of uh, crash probability. And although the, the value is you know, tending to the right or left, the distribution is only one part of how we predict the final ABCs. So the number of animal crossings uh, is also key, or NST. And so high exposure clusters, um, along with high PST, will show, will show us exactly where uh, there is a high risk for animal vehicle collisions. Uh, this is a plot of all the crash probabilities varying from you know, 0.1 to 0.9. And you can see some of them clustered in, in urban areas, uh, but more often than not, they are on all major roadways, um, especially the major thoroughways. And the, this is, so this is for January and this is for November. You can see that there are several more segments that light up. Um, and, and this is again a factor of how we have modeled uh, the seasonality. In terms of expected crash counts, which is NST, PST, uh, there is again that difference between January and October with uh, the coloring here. I don't know if you can notice the purple, but there is some purple you know, down here where there are in October um, more um, animal vehicle pollutions. So seasonality is mimicked well. And uh, we're happy with what the model is doing compared to what we saw in the data. And, and these locations with high NP values uh, are, are very time sensitive, so they can be considered time varying hotspots. So in October, they are a problem, but January, not so much. Uh, but it'll help us exactly identify or, or you know, safeguard um, so for crash prevention purposes. We wanted to test how a change in one of our variables would affect crash probability and, and you know, general animal vehicle collisions across the region. Uh, so we simulated uh, or re-estimated, sorry, we already estimated, so we predicted um, what a 10 mile per hour um, lowering of the speed limit would do. So you can see that then the expected um, uh, number of animal vehicle collisions shift by up to 12% in, in January and up to 4% in October. So speed, is likely not the only, um, is definitely, I guess, not the only concern in October because there are other things going on, but speed limit alone can affect uh, uh, or help a lot in terms of lowering the uh, animal vehicle collisions. And this probability is also reflected in uh, this the graph on the right, which plots the percentage change of uh, the likelihood of the probability of animal vehicle collisions. So, you can see that this model, like this is one example of lowering the speed limit, but we have several variables and it's, it's a model that we can accommodate more variables also so we can easily test and evaluate where we can be um, saving or, or saving a lot of money because of saving, uh, avoiding these collisions. So the contribution of this work was the new highly flexible semi-parametric framework um, to infer uh, animal vehicle collisions um, and at a scale of 120,000 plus segments across many months of the year. Um, so these uh, also, we were able to mimic the seasonality effects, which was neat. And uh, a lot of heterogeneity and unobserved heterogeneity was included, which with uh, more data, we can you know, identify what exactly uh, the, the effect causing variables are. The posterior analysis, uh, posterior analysis with this new data will also be useful, but already we have been able to identify time sensitive uh, hotspots and we can evaluate crash prevention measures. But there's a lot left to do. Um, so for future work, uh, someone could identify smarter ways to model this unknown exposure, which is now uh, just based on a you know, normal distribution, but we could fit um, some logistic model maybe under that to obtain the values or some binomial again to obtain the values. We could introduce a spatial autocorrelation 
in these values across segments um, so that the once the animal crossings are correlated spatially, the animal vehicle collisions can also be correlated, which would provide for a more continuous um, co continuous estimation of this value across the connected segments. Uh, but all of this obviously adds a lot more computational time. So variational inference um, might be key to manage this additional uh, runtime in estimation. And we mentioned earlier that the time of day was not in the data set. So exploring how time of day, um, how the time of day for animal vehicle collisions um, affect the, the you know, quantity can also be important. Uh, with that, thank you so much. Um, any questions and suggestions, I'm open now. Okay, thank you very much. So, so does anyone have any questions for uh, for, for Dr. Gurumurthy? Oh, I saw Ron had a question in the chat. I mean, the um, chat again, box. yeah. So, do you want to go ahead and do you want to go ahead and ask that, or should we just uh, read it? Uh, fine, you can go ahead and read that there. Okay, I, I can see that the study would be of interest to several different interest areas, both inside the transportation community and outside. What organization took the initiative and funded this project and what were the types of organizations that expressed interest while the study was underway? So this work was, um, was partly funded by the tech start, uh, by the Texas Department of Transportation. And also Dr. Kockelman had um, you know, interest in, in identifying more about the animal vehicle collision. So the initial part of the model, uh, the you know not the Bayesian model that we ran here, but some initial model estimates, which were more negative binomial and more traditional statistical analysis was done with that funding. And, if, uh, and we wanted to see how these um, you know, added uh, temporal seasonality and all of that can be understood. So we moved to the Bayesian framework. So, um, so yeah, the Texas Department of Transportation was very key in, in starting this project off. Um, and, and then we were continuing what we uh, got from the previous project and, and tried to push the boundaries on that. Mm -hmm. Thank the you. The, the future work that you're talking about also, do you see that being done, accomplished more so by the transportation community rather than uh, groups outside of the transportation community? Yes, I would think the transportation community would, would uh, should definitely look into uh, this future work. Um, I'm not sure who you mean by outside the transportation community, but you know this is uh, you know very crash focused and and transportation focused. So I'm curious what you mean. Right, uh, I'm thinking more of uh, various organizations that are sensitive to uh, animal related issues, or maybe national or city or state parks that also have animals uh, within their their confined areas. That's a great point. Um, I think I think you know, like right now, I'm not sure that the other um, organizations or communities are thinking about collisions from vehicles. I'm not sure. I I, I don't have that much uh, background on that, but definitely, like there is a lot of literature by transportation uh, folks and researchers um, on this kind of stuff. So I would I would think that you know that there is a lot of momentum to move this forward in in our own community. Uh -huh. Th thank you very much. All right, good, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, well, I have a couple of questions. I was, uh, I was, uh, one of the things I'm confused about is the N, the model for N. So it, mm -hmm. you said at some point you don't have observed number of animal crossings, which is not at all difficult for me to imagine. Mm -hmm. um, where you would even get that. There's nobody, <laughs> it's hard enough getting pedestrians, let alone getting animals crossing the road. Right. Um, so I'm curious about, so you, you set that up, but what was the basis for that? Like, where did you come up with mu and sigma? Yeah, so the, the prior, um, so it's not fully, uh, you know, parametric uh, or fully oh, okay. uh, adjusted with like observed data. So the, Animal crossings for us was based on animal vehicle collisions and trying to see, you know, based on how um, the distribution of animal vehicle collisions are. And finally, when PST gets into this, we were we can estimate the exposure just above the animal vehicle collision 
uh, line. Does that make sense? So for a given segment, we have animal vehicle collisions. We have all these factors that gives us the PFC. And we want to see um, exposure based on the, pro it, it's kind of a convoluted process, right? Uh, the exposure is based on animal vehicle collision. So there is a slight bias where, for example, if you don't notice animal vehicle collisions in certain segments, you might only get the exposure uh, to go up by one unit, for example, um, and, and in the probability will be low or zero because we don't have some data there. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise we want, like, like Ron mentioned also, if we can get data from other communities for um, where these animals exist or habitat, um, I think we could include that in the, or supplement this, this uh, model with that information to get better okay. estimates for exposure. So I think if I understand what you're saying, you, you said you, you looked at basically where you see the animal collisions over different time and space. And so mm -hmm. the frequency all over the place by time and also by space just helped you to just decide lo other locations or were you, just to try to try to, to get a, um, uh, to, to, to kind of conjure up a, a potential exposure. That's right. Because, okay. you know, the parameters beta that we estimate yeah. will be fixed for this region, right? Yeah. Um, so again, when you feed that back into places where you don't notice collisions, we can get that exposure based on those fitted probabilities because you still have segment level variables. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that so that mu and sigma were basically developed by that Dirichlet pr process. Exactly. Okay. So the All Dirichlet right. process gives you clusters yeah. which are which each have these mu sigma. Patterns. Got it. I I understand. It makes sense now. Okay. So um, and also you did a probability. I think I missed this, but your probability of animal collision for a given place was over what what amount of time was that for? Uh, can you tell me if it was this figure? Yeah, something like this. Yeah, so is this for is this for a month? Yeah, so each of these colors is for a month. Um, right. So, so the prob the, the probability at the bottom there it says is that a probability of a collision at that location in a month? So the, this is the probability of collision across all the one hundred twenty thousand segments. So we get the histograms for a given month. So S is still varying to give us um, you know the histogram, but T is fixed. For January and for October. But again, what I'm saying this is over what period of time is that is that probability? Is that for the month? And that's and over what kind of space? Is that over the entire? Is that just anywhere, or is that at a at a location? It is anywhere in uh, anywhere in the 120,000 link space, um, and it's for that given month, January or October. Because yeah. you, you see some probabilities get really close to one. In fact, there's a couple that were one. And so, right. so that's, so you're saying that that's, that's how many, but it says how many segments, as you say over there. So that's how many segments had a probability of one in that month. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So the reason we choose the binomial um, is so that, <laughs> you know, we have some one probability segments here, Yeah, I, but like. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. But what I'm getting at is that there were two, there were a couple of segments there that the probability of a crash was one. Mm -hmm. That's predicted as one. That's what I wanted to get clear about. And I was trying to understand over what period of time that was. So it's one month. So what it's basically saying is that at that location, there is nearly certainly going to be an animal collision that month at that place. Yes. If, yeah, I mean, I understand that. I can, I can believe that's possible because there are places where that's, you know, you know, it's it's very likely because of the various things that are going on around around. But it's, anyway, it's just I just wanted to get clear about that because that's you don't often see the numbers like that, right? Right, right, yeah. But like I said, it, it is if there is a crossing. Yeah, and um, then so there, and know. then yeah. yeah, and then there was. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, and so then if you're, so as you're in other words, saying if there an, if an animal crosses there, it will get hit. Is that what it's saying? Or <laughs> I mean, that, that, that is how the model is predicting. Yeah. This. Okay. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. All right. Um, and then how did you choose these analysis segments? You may have said that and I missed it also, but because um, it looks like obviously not every road segment in the entire state, but it was selected based on where you actually see animal collision. Uh, no, this, 
this data comes from the Texas roadway inventory. So it's, it's all the road, uh, road, it's all the segments that are under the Texas Department of Transportation's purview. So it's, it's most oh, of the okay. interstates, most of uh, there are several uh, roads okay. you know, even in the city, but everything that's under Okay, because some of you showed a graph that just showed us a few segments, which was not all of them. That's why I got confused. This one? No, no. There's one where you had it was towards the end, I think. So I think those are like when we are showing specific probabilities. So we were just showing okay. where, where okay. the probabilities are. Okay, I thought I saw some actual segments as well that were that were pulled out. I'm not sure. I think these are the only. Uh, yeah. I okay. I'm, I'm. I don't know. Maybe be thinking of something else. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, but thanks very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Any final questions? All right. Well, I guess that's it then. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Is uh, this, we saw some very good. I think these are some very interesting um, safety-related uh, presentations hitting very different directions in safety, which is nice to see. Uh, looking at things that are, and again, I think are um, uh, important questions that we need to be that we need to be looking at, and 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 are really going to be helpful for advancing safety. Uh, one of the things I've been noticing in my re in my years of research is in, in road safety is that just focusing on the road characteristics and trying to model estimate models to predict that is just not cutting it anymore because. There's so many other variations, so many other things that are explaining that we're just not we're not catching most of the things that are really explaining the variation and, and where crashes occur. So I think this is really interesting to find learn a little bit more about what we what we can do to to, to reduce crashes and especially fatalities. So anyway, thank you all. I had just a brief comment on the lighter side, uh, but I did mention that it's interesting to note that the greater number of incidences tend to occur during mating season, which tells me that the animals have something else in their minds rather than their own safety at that time. Well, it's, that is probably right, Ron. And, um, and I think that, I mean, that's just, we know, <coughs> excuse me, that's something that we kind of already know, people who live in areas where you're driving through animal populations, that's kind of understood that that later part of the year is when you really do see the the see them more often and and i think that is part of the reason why is that they're they're um they're not the animals aren't paying attention just like just like the people don't sometimes pay attention so anyway so thanks everybody again and i think we'll just wrap this up then a little bit early you get a little bit of a break before the next session start um so um so anyway so again thanks everybody for showing up thank you Thank you, everyone. Thanks for Dr. Thank Ivan for moderating this session. Bye-bye. Okay. Hey, bye, everybody. Okay, I think it's time to start this session. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this session in the afternoon. It's about two hours. Um, it's about public uh, transport. We have four papers in total. And yeah, we have uh, four speakers, including me. I'm, I'm going to be the last speaker. So um, um, I, I will mute everyone um, during the presentation and open the, like the unmute function when like the question and answer session comes up. Okay, so um, let's start with the first presentation. It's about, uh, and the speaker is uh, Lawrence De Beer. He attended Pretoria Boys High School and matriculated in 2012, where well after he, oh, wait, I guess, uh, well after he went on to study civil engineering <clears throat> at the University of Pretoria in 2018, Lawrence did his honors and completed his master's degree in 2019 with distinction. The topics of his honors and master's research involved optimization, optimization of BRT line and modeling the impact of priority infrastructure on the minibus taxi industry, respectively. Lawrence's is uh, current, currently busy with the second year of his PhD degree on the Professor Crystal Vanner. So um, let's hand the microphone to uh,
Good luck, Lawrence. Hello, can everyone see my um, presentation now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, good day, everyone. My name is Lawrence De Beer from the University of Pretoria. Um, I will be presenting on my, my paper deals with priority infrastructure for minibus. Sorry, for minibus taxi for the minibus taxi industry. Um, it's an, an analytical model of the potential benefits and impacts. And the co-author is Professor Christy Finter. So, uh, sorry. So the paratransit industry or the minibus taxi industry as it is known in South Africa um, has grown from a modest provider of public transport to the largest supplier of mobility to the urban public. Small scale ownership of minibus taxis enabled the industry to develop in an adaptive and flexible way where the fares remain low and the service services respond rapidly to any changes in need from the passengers. There have been recent initiatives by the government to overhaul South Africa's entire public transport system to address deficiencies of the minibus taxi system, which have often resulted in a complex set of formal and informal operations, which are independent of each other, then subject to a regulatory framework that is disconnected. There have been some efforts to improve the infrastructure for minibus taxi facilities and operations, including undercover loading lanes, public toilets, and office space. The use of dedicated road space, as well as time of day and right of way, reserved public transport is scarce and where implemented is poorly enforced. Qualitative studies regarding the response of the minibus tax industry to proposed changes and formalization of the industry to be incorporated into the bus rapid transit system has been well, has been well documented. Research pertaining to the driving behavior of the vehicle operators, however, is limited. Studies regarding the use of priority infrastructure to improve minibus tax efficiency is also limited. Minibus taxi operators often try to cut corners, literally and figuratively, in their efforts to save time. This is mainly due to pressure being put on them by their passengers and they need to survive financially. The need to maximize income by finding more passengers and reducing cycle times in order to complete more round trips during the peak period means that it is often in their best interest to weave their way through traffic to get ahead of congestion. With the use of a drone, this behavior was observed along various corridors in the Pretoria area. This is meant as an observational study to find exemplars of such behavior and the implications, rather than exhaustive survey of behaviors. The following three cases illustrate the delay advantage that operators try to gain at intersections with long queues. In the first case, a minibus taxi on the through movement is observed driving in the right turn lane. After the, um, the traffic signal turns green, the taxi is seen cutting into the lane adjacent to it, thereby effectively skipping eight vehicles in the queue. This is due to the adjacent lane having a shorter queue length. The, be the behavior is like a queue jumping lane form of infrastructure and jumping past such a long queue of vehicles saves this particular taxi approximately 24 seconds. In the second case, it is much like the first case in that um, it, it acts like an informal queue jumping lane. But this time, however, two minibus taxis skip the queue as soon as the traffic signal um, turns green. From their behavior, the, traffic's traveling the taxi traveling behind attempts to push in first into the center lane, after which allowing the taxi in front of it to do the same. This illustrates the sense of community minibus taxi operators have um, in, a in an attempt to help each other out when the opportunity arises. In this case, the two minibus taxis skip a queue of over 12 vehicles and can save an approximate 66 seconds um, before they avoid, um, because they avoid being stuck in the overflow queue at the end of the cycle. In the final case observed, 
a minibus taxi is seen traveling in the lane of the oncoming traffic, after which it makes a right turn. This behavior is more dangerous than the previous two cases. Only one second is saved in this process, as the queue that forms at the intersection only amounts to a single vehicle traveling in front of it. It was the endeavor of this research to quantify using mathematical modeling in Excel, the benefits that minibus taxi operators receive when they skip traffic queues during congested periods of the day. An analytical approach was developed for a single bi-directional corridor with intersections rather than simulating the behavior at a network wide level. Mathematical equations were developed from first principles to calculate the driving cost along the corridor. The impact on safety, which could be a large economic cost, was not quantified. The objectives of the sub-study were summarized as follows. Firstly, to identify priority infrastructure alternatives from literature and to determine their suitability for improving operating conditions in the paratransit industry. Secondly, to develop mathematical models to ascertain the benefits of various priority infrastructure measures under a range of operating and demand conditions. And then thirdly, to quantify the high level economic impact that selected priority infrastructure would have on the paratransit operators, the passengers and other road users. Four forms of infrastructure were modeled, namely a queue a curbside taxi stop, a queue jumping lane, a single lane pre-signal strategy, and a dedicated taxi lane. The intersection consists of a north-south and an east-west two-lane road. The minibus taxis and regular vehicles travel mixed as there is no priority um, for the um, paratransit vehicles at the intersection pertaining to the curbside stop. This form of infrastructure will be considered as the base case against which to compare all the subsequent forms of priority infrastructure. The figure illustrates the schematic model upon which calculations are based. All taxi stops in the sub subsequent figures are indicated with the red triangle. For simplicity's sake, only the west to east movement is modeled, but the results can easily be generalized for both directions. The second um, public transport priority infrastructure, the queue jumping lane, allows the minibus taxis to skip the entire queue at the intersection by providing them with a dedicated section of road. Minibus taxis queue in the left lane and private vehicles queue in the center lane. The dedicated green phase given to taxis allow the queue to dissipate and during this phase, um, left turns are allowed. Green is then available to all vehicles and only left turns are allowed in the left lane. During the red cycle phase, taxis can drop off and pick up travelers in the dedicated lane, but are not able to make stops during the priority green phase or during the green phase to all vehicles. The percentage of taxis stopping to pick up or drop off passengers is based on an input value in the model. The third priority infrastructure, the single lane pre-signal strategy, provides taxis with a time advantage without incurring significant construction costs. A mix of minibus taxis and private vehicles form, taxis adjacent to the red lane can cross over and pick up and drop, drop off passengers. Minibus taxis receive a priority green and only taxis in the red lane can, are able to use the priority green phase of the intersection. The queue of private vehicles can then dissipate. The length of the priority section of road is designed to account for the number of private vehicles that queue over the duration of the east-west green phase. Only taxis adjacent to the priority section of road are permitted to use it to gain a time advantage. It is noted, however, that boarding or alighting of a minibus taxi in the middle of the road is dangerous and that a raised curb in the center of the road may have to be constructed to account for this issue. The final priority infrastructure, the dedicated taxi lane, is expected to provide public transport with the greatest amount of time savings whilst minimizing the delay experienced by regular traffic.
The objective of the model was to quantify the high level economic impact that the selected priority infrastructure would have on the paratransit operator, taxi passengers, other road users, and the agency providing the infrastructure, which would in this case be the government. This meant that the model would consist of four main sections, which included the signalized intersection design, which determined the cycle length, the red phase length, and green phase length, the user cost, which entailed the time passengers, entailed the time passengers in the minimized taxi, as well as private vehicle owners spent on the road, the operating cost, which is based on time spent on the road, as well as the distance covered, and included all costs associated with operating a minibus taxi or a private vehicle. And then finally, the capital cost, which is the cost associated with constructing each of the four forms of public transport infrastructure. The model flow rates are also included here, which were, which were um, recorded during various times of the day in the Pretoria area um, for the sake of accuracy. The main output of the model um, will now be discussed, but before I'd just briefly like to mention that the model was only a one kilometer corridor. The assumption of the model also included to preserve the level of service for private vehicle users. Only the west to east um, travel was considered and the cycle time was kept constant for all four forms of, trans of um, infrastructure. It is noted though that the limitation of the model included that it is a simplified model with no detailed sim simulation and no turning was considered. So for the first of the outputs is travel time, which is a primary component of the user cost. The figure illustrates the travel time for traveling along a notional one kilometer corridor with one intersection that includes the stopping time at the intersection as well as acceleration and deceleration time by either minibus taxi or private vehicles. For the base case, the current case, um, um, the, and for the dedicated taxi lane, the taxis experience more delay than cars due to the assumed far side stop after clearing of the intersection. By comparison, the queue jumping lane and the single lane pre-signal strategy delivers a significant decrease in travel time of 3.2 minutes per trip. This is attributable to the priority green phase that reduces minibus taxi queuing time, as well as the use of the red time for passenger boarding and the lighting. The dedicated taxi lane sees a 32% or 1.8 minute reduction in travel time over the length of the corridor. Private vehicles experience a 1% decrease in travel time when moving from the curbside stop to any of the public transport infrastructure forms. This is due to the elimination of the delay that minibus taxis cause when they decelerate to enter the curbside bay, which does not apply to any of the other cases. The hourly user cost um, results are then ex are also expressed um, yeah, but in terms of a per passenger trip basis, this is done by dividing the total hourly cost, excuse me. This is done by dividing the total hourly cost by the number of traffic arrivals per hour and the vehicle occupancy. A few observations are pertinent. Firstly, user costs rise for the high flow cases compared to low flow cases due to the extra queuing delay at the intersection. Secondly, for all three infrastructure interventions, minibus taxi user costs are lower than those of private vehicle users, varying by between 22 cents to 45 cents. This is caused by a combination of two factors. Firstly, the delay reductions due to the priority given to public transport. And secondly, the lower value of time applied to taxi users as compared to car users. And then thirdly, car users, the car user cost hardly change when implementing priority features for public transport this in line with the study objectives. Lastly, and most importantly, with the priority treatments, um, excuse me, the minibus taxi user cost decline, decline significantly with the um, priority treatments reflecting the delay savings accruing to taxi passengers. 
The operating cost per passenger trip for minibus taxis and private vehicles is illustrated in this figure. Per person car costs are much higher than those of a taxi trip, largely due to the lower occupancy of the private car. The minibus taxi operating cost sees a 50% decrease when the curbside stop is compared to the queue jumping lane and a 49% and 29% decrease when compared to the single lane pre-signal strategy and the dedicated taxi lane strategies respectively. This is largely driven by the reduction in travel time and whilst the dedicated taxi lane should yield the lowest operating cost, this is not the case due to the relatively low minibus taxi flow rate. To give a sense of the potential cumulative benefits of the operating cost whilst um, to minibus taxi operators, the savings were estimated for a notional five kilometer route with priority inter intersection spaced at 500 meter intervals. Considering a minibus taxi operator working eight hours a day for 22 days in a month, an upper, savings, an upper limit to the savings was obtained. And assume, if it was assumed that the benefits accrue only during the morning and evening peak hours, thus 44 hours per month, a lower limit is obtained. The estimates show that a notional minibus taxi operator may save between 19,000 Rand and 32,000 Rand when using the priority infrastructure on a single idealized route over the course of a month. These translate into potential savings of between 41 and 66% of taxi operating costs. This makes a strong case for the implementation of these infrastructure forms on busy corridors as a way of delivering cost savings to operators. If these savings are passed on to passengers through fare reductions, passengers would also reap monetary benefit. An additional benefit to operators is that of a higher vehicle productivity due to shorter cycle times. During peak periods, minibus taxis can make 54% more trips using the queue jumping lane, 56% more using the signal lane pre-signal strategy, and 32% more using the dedicated taxi lanes. These benefits can translate into a higher revenue, assuming that there is an over-served passenger demand or low, fleet, low enough fleet sizes. This figure shows the total cost expressed on a per passenger basis. As expected due to their higher occupancy, minibus taxis transport passengers at significantly lower average cost to society than private cars. More importantly, the overall cost for the priority infrastructure cases are between 25 and 45% lower than for the base case, indicating that the estimated additional infrastructure cost of constructing priority infra um, facilities at intersections are more than offset by savings in operating costs and travel time for um, taxi passengers. And this is done without significantly raising costs for private vehicles. Once again, the queue jumping and single lane pre-signal strategies have the lowest overall cost due to their minimal infrastructure requirements. A sensitivity analysis was carried out to check the robustness of the analysis against various um, variations in key input variables. These variables included the length of the corridor, the ratio of minibus taxi occupancy to private vehicle occupancy, passenger handling time for minibus taxis, percentage of minibus taxi stopping to pick up or drop off passengers, and the minibus taxi vehicle hours traveled in a month. The values in the table indicate the change when the base input value is compared to the upper limit value using total cost per passenger trip as the value being compared. So corridor length, while keeping the number of priority intersections constant, had the largest impact on the output as it implied a longer um, travel distance between priority intersections. Longer corridors then reduced the um, comparative advantage of the queue jumping lane and signal lane pre-signal strategy the most as the time savings became less significant relative to total operating cost. All other sensitivity tests enhanced the relative attractiveness of the queue jumping and pre-signal strategies over the other two interventions. The results are thus consistent with the outputs delivered by the model and do not cause the relative ranking of the treatments to change. In conclusion, 
The curbside stop is favored by local authorities in South Africa as a first step towards um, regularizing taxi operations, operations and reducing delay to other vehicles. However, the net benefits can be substantially increased by using the same curb space for other forms of public transport at busy intersections. The single lane pre-signal strategy and the queue jumping lane prove to benefit the minibus taxi operators as well as its passengers, allowing the driver to make more trips and reducing the time a passenger spends on the road. These two infrastructure forms can be imp implemented at busy intersections where there is no space to increase road capacity. The dedicated taxi lane also holds significant benefits, but at a greater financial cost. The location for a dedicated taxi lane should be along a corridor that experiences a significant flow of minibus taxis, which will make it a more competitive alternative to the other two infrastructure forms. In none of the examined cases did the cost of a car of car passengers change substantially because of the taxi treatments. Although this was built into the design of the treatments, it is important to note that it is possible to give substantial benefits to public transport users without necessarily degrading the level of service of car users. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation, Lawrence. Um, it was quite an interesting presentation. I'm impressed that like uh, a many of us like can go to the opposite, then jump jump across the intersection, which is very interesting. Um, so we have one question from Dr. Kalkman. She asked, um, which of these treatments or designs is the most cost effective? Like, uh, which offers the highest uh, benefit benefit cost ratio? after valuing like time savings, construction, uh, fuel losses, uh, something like this, and across all travelers preference functions, vehicle owners and public agency invest, you know, investors. Yes, the, the public, I think each of the interventions have their own merits. So, so you want, one would have to look at the type of of section of road that you're dealing with. If you if there's enough space to widen the road and there's a high demand for um, minibus taxis, then a dedicated lane would be the most cost effective since that would then, providing them with their own section of road, the reduction in cost would then, um, on an economic scale, would reduce the cost. But at there are sections where a past, where minibus taxi only needs to pick up a small number of passengers then the other two cases, the queue jumping lane and the signal lane pre-signal strategy would prove to be more effective since they are given um, a few seconds to quickly stop at the red at the red signal phase and pick up or drop off passengers and then continue with their route and not make a long formal stop. But the cheapest overall is the signal lane pre-signal strategy because that doesn't involve any significant construction cost. There, there would be some cost um, involved with the um, adding of traffic signals and so on, but that would be the most cost effective of the of the four interventions. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, I actually have uh, like one or two questions about this, like just like uh, Dr. Kalkman just placed it in the chat box. I also did uh, something um, similar similar to investigate like different sizes of like like kind of the mini buses to serve a corridor with like different settings in the traffic signal or the places to like a parking bay so that the vehicle won't uh, interrupt the, 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 the corridor. So one question I have is, is about like the settings, like the, the pictures you just showed about like the dots representing the vehicles. I'm wondering if like, is this some simulation you did or like you did actually did it in, like in mathematical formulation to calculate the cost or the travel time? It was done um, mainly using um, from first principles using um, various equations from other papers, how they calculated the, the delay at intersections and so on. So then the next step of, of my future work for my PhD then focuses on simulation, um, looking at an implementing these interventions at a network-wide level. But this was mainly 
st um, started off with baby steps due to the, the difficulty in actually acquiring data from the minibus taxi industry in South Africa, which is very difficult because they don't really like being monitored or tracked. So actually getting taxi organizations in South Africa to agree to being um, tracked is very difficult because a lot of them don't operate necessarily legally or they don't keep to the routes that for which they are provided licenses. So it was just the first step, but um, since then I have acquired um, better GPS tracking data. So the, the, I'm working now currently on simulating at a network wide level to see in a, at a city wide level if um, what the benefits would be. Cool, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I also find like um, a lot of things that we need to consider like like different positions of the of the like the like the point to pick up passengers, like different size of the of the vehicles, how they can operate. Yeah, a lot of things to consider. Yeah. But it's yeah. it's a very interesting one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um let's move on to the second speaker. Um Howding is a product uh, a, do a doctor student at UCLA Department of Urban Planning and Researcher at UCLA Institute of Transportation Studies. He has done research in urban design and transportation policy. His recent work on transportation looked at homeless on transit, sexual harassment on transit, public health risks on transit during the pandemic, and the uh, effects of tra uh, traffic impact studies on land use development. So how you can start sharing your screen now. Hello. Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, Uh, hi, um, my name is Hao Ding. I will present uh, our work on homelessness in transit environments. This is um, uh, done by a team led by Professor Anastasia Lokaitos Terres uh, and then my colleagues Jacob Barsman and Ryan Carl. Um, Are the slides working properly? Um, I'm sorry. Um, it seems like my recorded. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you have like your one? Is playing sound. I'm sorry. You were saying. I, I, I was saying. Do you have like the version? You you don't have recordings in it, so you can so you can speak up. Or... Is, is there a way to turn off the narration? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this will work. Yeah, I think uh, it's good now. So I'm uh, sorry about that. Um, so like, I, like the narration said, I'd like to start with uh, a little bit of context about what we knew before the study, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the details of our survey design. And then I'll focus on three major areas of uh, our survey findings. Uh, first is extent of homelessness on transit environments, transit systems, and then the challenges that transit operators face 
in addressing the issue and then um, highlighting some of their responses um, or their strategies in uh, addressing the issue. And then uh, we also did follow up case studies based on what we found in, in a survey about what, what certain transit agencies did. Uh, I will highlight uh, some um, key uh, strategies that we found through the case studies. And then lastly, I will conclude with a set of recommendations for uh, how transit operators can, can do in response to the, the homelessness crisis on their systems. Okay, so what we knew from other literature and uh, also surveys that, that were done before ours is that um, transit is a very important is a very important and often used mode for people experiencing homelessness. So they can use it for uh, shelter. They can use also use it for mobility, um, for to travel to their uh, uh, needed destinations. And uh, they, those those experiencing homelessness on transit tend to be more disadvantaged and more likely chronically unhoused. Uh, and we and we also knew that the extent of homelessness varies across transit systems. They tend to be more severe on larger systems in uh, larger metropolitan areas where the issue of homelessness is more extensive. Um, since the pandemic, uh, homeless counts have gone up in some systems like the uh, LA Metro, but not necessarily in others. Uh, it didn't go up um, in on uh, uh, um, BART. And uh, overall, this is an understudied topic. So hopefully this is where our survey findings will shed light on. Okay, so for the survey, we um, so we we designed a thirty seven question online survey. Uh, we emailed the survey to we first reviewed this. Uh, beta test and reviewed the survey um, by sending it to staff at Caltrans, CDA, uh, some other transit agencies in the area, and also our colleagues at the school. We then emailed the survey to uh, staff members at 238 transit agencies in the US and Canada. We got about a 48% response rate. So you'll see we have 115 operators responding. Uh, and we have actually a total of 142 staff members. So the reason why this, these two, num two numbers don't match is because we asked uh, if staff in multiple departments within a certain agency are familiar, were familiar with the homelessness issue, we encourage uh, all of them to respond to our survey. So you, you can also see on the maps where the map itself shows uh, the agencies that responded to our survey. And then if there is a number attached to it, that means multiple uh, staff members answered our survey at that agency. Um, and another thing to highlight is that we have an oversample for California. Uh, we have a total of 52 operators from uh, uh, California responding to our survey. Uh, and then in the findings, we, for the more factual questions, we of, we report the findings based on uh, responses from operators. And then for the more subjective questions, we we'll, we report findings based on uh, responses from individual staff members. Okay, so the first major uh, topic of finding is the extent of homelessness on transit systems. 
Uh, so the first thing to highlight is that not many agencies take counts of uh, or keep track of unhoused riders on their system. So they can, most of them can only give estimates and some of them cannot even give estimates. So, uh, um, but uh, based on what the estimates show, um, we find that homelessness is, uh, is seen across most US and Canadian transit systems, but to varying degrees. Um, among the agencies that gave estimates, 51% of them reported having a hundred, well, reported having an estimated number of over a hundred uh, homeless people on their systems daily. And then 16% uh, reported over 500 people. And they are mostly large agencies. Uh, many are on the West Coast or in the Mountain West area. Uh, like I said before, very few, very few agencies take accounts of unhoused riders. They only come for 6% of our total responses. Uh, and then uh, about a quarter could not provide even a rough estimate of people experiencing homelessness. So that's that just shows the um, uh, the lack of accurate data on how the on how extensive this issue is. Um, and then since the onset of the pandemic, uh, agencies report more unhoused riders uh, than before. This uh, the bottom bar chart shows that about half of the agencies reported having more unhoused people, unhoused riders on their systems. 26% uh, said no change and only 5% of the agencies said they actually saw fewer people, fewer uh, unhoused riders on their system. And then uh, besides the variation across systems, uh, there is also variation uh, in terms of the extent of the issue uh, across different modes and also different settings. So uh, most agencies see more homelessness on their bus and uh, rails. And uh, in terms of settings, uh, homelessness is more seen on uh, transit stops, stations, or platforms, or actually around them, uh, and uh, less on the vehicles, and even fewer on um, rights of way, agency parking lots, and uh, yards and facilities. And for the last three categories, they usually tend to be the uh, camps, uh, homeless encampments. All right, the, the second major set of findings is about uh, the challenges faced by uh, transit agencies in responding to the, to the issue. So um, the, 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 the chart here uh, re reports the findings uh, based on um, individual respondents, individual staff respondents because this is more, this is a more subjective question. We asked whether they deem several uh, the issues listed here as a mi major or a minor or not a challenge to their system. So the biggest ones are the extent of the issue and other writers' concerns about unhoused people on the system. Uh, some others include lack of fun funding, lack of support from governments, um, unclear or undeveloped policies, uh, lack of training within their, their, uh, uh, their agency, uh, lack of partnerships with other agencies that uh, serve the uh, homeless population. Um, another thing to note is that these challenges are reported as worse since uh, 2016, we, we got this conclusion based on the comparison of our survey with a survey done in the 2016. Uh, we can do this because we used um, many similar questions uh, 
as the previous survey, so we can um, do this comparison, although we, we did get different samples. Uh, so the differences is only suggestive. And then uh, we did find out from our survey that the challenges have become worse since the pandemic, and it is worse on larger operators as compared to on smaller ones. Uh, because a lot of our survey respondents believe that uh, homelessness on their systems can depress ridership among housed riders. Uh, so we focus a lot on this uh, issue of housed riders concerns. So we first asked them if they receive any complaints about homelessness on their systems. Uh, about the vast majority, 86% of the agency said, yes, they did receive complaints. And then among them, the most common ones are hygiene, aggressive behavior, uh, fear, uh, discomfort, cleanliness, and the last one, spread of disease is more relevant since the pandemic. Again, these concerns are reported uh, are more severe since 2016. Um, it is also more severe on large operators. Uh, and also, we compared uh, answers to this question among different uh, staff from different departments within the, uh, the transit, transit agency. So safety and security staff tend to rate these concerns as more severe as compared to their colleagues in other departments. The next set of findings uh, is about agency responses. So um, staff from these agent, our responding agencies consider responding to homelessness as important, but not perhaps not their most important task. So it, they rate it as average, uh, an average of 3.5 out of a five Flecker scale. Uh, but only 19% of the, of the agencies have developed formal policies on homelessness and they, they're, they're more likely to be large operators. Uh, also very few change their policies after the uh, series of prote protests against police brutality in 2020. Still, even without formal policies, uh, agencies take measures in responding to homelessness. And these uh, different measures can be roughly grouped into two main categories. One is uh, more punitive uh, enforcement related. The other is more uh, supportive of the unhoused riders. Um, they are more service and outreach related. So for enforcement actions, the major ones are, uh, the most common ones is uh, requiring people to uh, disembark the, the vehicle and pay fare again at the end of the lines or the um, trips to, to basically to uh, prevent them from spending uh, more time on the, on the vehicle. Another one is a uh, common one is structural elements or landscaping to discouraging sleeping uh, on facilities, uh, the so-called hostile or defensive architecture. Uh, another one is enforcement of anti-loitering laws uh, as well, uh, and then clearance of encampments from transit settings as well as sweeps from areas where unhoused people tend to congregate, those are basically ways to uh, remove or displace the uh, uh, unhoused riders from uh, the, the systems. For services and outreach actions, uh, you, you, you can, by comparing the percentages listed here, you can start to see that fewer agencies take uh, services and outreach actions as compared to enforcement actions. Uh, but the biggest one in this category is discounted or free fares for unhoused riders, or they do this by distributing transit passes to social service providers who then pass these to homeless, uh, to people experiencing homelessness. 
Another one is using vehicles and facilities as cooling or heating centers. Um, these are usually done in extreme weather, weather conditions. And then uh, the third one is uh, additional service or modified service connecting homeless riders to uh, and house riders to either shelters or other uh, locations where they usually go, like uh, social service uh, locations and uh, libraries. Uh, certainly the pandemic has uh, led to changes in the responses. So the pandemic has caused 41% of agencies to rethink or to rethink their policies or to develop new policies uh, in response to homelessness. And then about 30% about started to uh, intensify their responses to homelessness because of the rise of uh, the, the increase of uh, this population under system during the pandemic. And then 29% uh, started new partnerships and uh, or implemented new strategies to um, respond to homelessness. Um, a common response in the during the pandemic is uh, about fair collection, although this is not um, targeted at home uh, unhoused riders, but they this did affect many of them. So during the pandemic, many agencies have suspended fares enforcement um, or removed fares altogether. We found that agencies without fare or fare enforcement reported higher numbers of people experiencing homelessness uh, on their systems. But we find that the difference between um, fare free and collecting fares is not statistically significant. Whereas the difference between enforcing fares and not enforcing fares is uh, significant. So the difference really is uh, because of enforcement of fares, not uh, uh, collecting fares itself. And um, some factors behind the homelessness response is um, so a big one is the lack of resources uh, mentioned by many, many uh, respondents. Almost no agencies receive external funding to address the issue. Uh, only 16% have uh, dedicated staff for this uh, problem. A little over half offer training to their employees, to their frontline employees, about how to re uh, interact with unhoused riders. Um, and then uh, we can't stress this enough, the importance of uh, partnerships because transit agencies have limited resources and expertise in dealing with homelessness. So uh, partnerships are absolutely very important for them. 86% have one or more external partnerships. Uh, and then 69% agencies have partnered with law enforcement, 58% have partnered with public social service agencies, 51% have partnered with nonprofit and private organizations that, that serve the uh, homeless population. So again, from here you, you see that uh, uh, based on the, partner, the kind of partnerships that agencies uh, form, it seems like um, there's still a lot of reliance on law enforcement over uh, outreach and service actions in dealing with homelessness on transit. And lastly, most operators would consider their response as somewhat successful or neutral in addressing the issue. Uh, following the, what we found in the survey, we followed up with uh, some uh, agencies that said they had uh, specific strategies designed to address homelessness. 
Uh, and then based on our case studies, we, we uh, grouped these uh, various strategies into four major categories. Um, so the first one is hub of services. So this is where a transit agency would set aside a space, a physical space within the system, usually at a very centralized location where it serves as a hub of all kinds of services that homeless people need. Um, and then they can uh, visit and for consultation for different services, medical or uh, non-medical consulting uh, consultations, as well as uh, about connecting to other, other social service agencies. The second is mobile outreach. So this is where agencies send uh, staff members uh, often in partnership with other uh, organizations to reach out to uh, house riders on their system and then try to connect them to connect them, uh, condemn, connect them to uh, social service providers and other uh, medical or um, non-medical services. So these two are more uh, focused on the services and supported, uh, supporting the services that support uh, people experiencing homelessness. The last two discounted fares and transportation to shelters, they focus more on improving the mobility of uh, unhoused riders. So discounted fares can lower the cost of travel for uh, people experiencing homelessness. And transportation to shelters is where uh, special arrangement can be made to uh, move uh, unhoused people around uh, between uh, shelters and other frequently visited locations. All right, uh, for conclusions, we have a set of recommendations on what transit operators can do. First, uh, the most important one is to collect more and better data about uh, the, so to, to better know the extent of the issue, uh, because that, that will be the basis for policy making, right? And then uh, they can rethink fair policies re in regard to homelessness. Uh, they, they can also expand outreach strategies to support uh, in, in, in partnership with uh, other agencies to support the uh, homeless population. And uh, like I said before, due to the limited capacity and expertise in addressing the issue of homelessness, it is very important for transit agencies to establish partnerships with uh, social service agencies, with nonprofit or private organizations, uh, with uh, also with uh, law enforcement in certain cases. And then uh, there is need for more funding, more dedicated funding to address the issue and also more uh, dedicated staff to address the issue. And then uh, based on what we found through the survey and case studies, there are already transit agencies around the nation that's uh, doing some that, that's uh, adopting some good strategies uh, to address the issue. So there's this need to basically uh, disseminate these best practices um, so that uh, agencies without prior experience or with limited uh, resources can learn uh, from uh, agencies with some experiences or even even some successful experiences. And then lastly, uh, there's this need to center the mobility and well-being of unhoused riders as part of the social responsibility of uh, public transit operations. Uh, with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Uh, our findings are summarized in two reports. Uh, they can be found on the UCLA ITS website here, uh, the link is included here. Thank you.
Thank you so much for the presentation, Tom. It's pretty interesting. Um, any questions, comments from the audience? I, I will just uh, allow you to unmute yourself and ask questions. So open the microphone. Okay, we are running a little bit short of time for the Q&A session. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly ask one or two questions. I think the, the it's, it's pretty interesting. And like, this is the first time I, I heard about like learning about the homeless people from like a transportation perspective. Um, so the, the first that I'm curious is about like how these agencies got like the information from these homeless. Are they like, they, did they do some survey or they have like different data sources for that? Uh, yeah, so you mean uh, how do transit agencies get data about homelessness on their systems, right? Yeah, because I think you learn from the agency and how the agencies yeah. learn from these homeless people. So, uh, so the, 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 the main problem is that they don't actually know very well. Uh, so about the extent of the issue on their system, they can know. Most of them can only guess or estimate. Only a, uh, only a very few, a, a very small set of uh, agencies actually count the number of uh, unhoused riders on their system, uh, either daily or monthly. Um, like what, um, um, and those those tend to be larger agencies like LA Metro or BART. Um, and then uh, for some other questions that we ask, um, we basically rely on the knowledge of the staff member that actually deals with this issue a lot in their actual work. Uh, so most of our, most of our uh, survey respondents are either from the security or safety departments from the transit agency or from um, operations uh, department. So they, either receive a lot of complaints from uh, house riders about homelessness on the system, or they receive reports from their staff. So that's how we, get, that's how they know about the situation. And then we rely on that for our, our study. Yeah, 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 I totally agree that it's kind of challenging to, to get such kind of data. Um, yeah, just, I just want to quickly follow up on that. Um, I think you mentioned that like uh, the agencies observed like the homeless people at different like transportation places, but I'm just wondering if this like uh, exclusive or are you expecting any other places that you may like observe these people in addition to like the like the information from the transportation agencies. Um. Yeah, we didn't, I don't think we asked for other settings, um, but those are the major ones. Um, um, let's see. Yeah, it's, so based it's on, of, uh, yeah, go ahead. Please. So I, I was just going to say, based on what the staff member knows, uh, they, they either receive reports or complaints, and then they either, uh, and they, ca they can also visit the facility or sites. Um, the, the complaints and reports usually come from vehicles or transit stations, and then um, other facilities of their own agencies, they, all, they usually receive staff reports about that. Um, other settings, we don't, um, yeah, we don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just like thinking about that. It's kind of a suggestion, like maybe you can take a look into that to help. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, sure. thanks, thanks again for your presentation. And yeah, we are running short of, a little short of time. So let me just move to the next speaker. Um, Jacob man uh, he manages research into public transit and other mobility issues at UCLA Institute for Transportation Studies. 
Prior to joining IDS, he worked for the cities of Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New Haven on capital planning, active transportation, and demand management. He also served as a transportation justice fellow for Bay Area Rapid Transit Director Latifah Simon, coordinating passage of the system safe uh, transit sanctuary policy. Parsonman has a master's a Master of Urban and Regional Planning from the UCLA Laskin School of Public Affairs. Take off, Thornton. Thanks. Um, share my screen here. Can you see the slides now? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so my name is Jacob Wasserman. Thanks uh, so much for having me um, speak today. Um, I'll be talking about our research on following transit ridership just before the pandemic. Um, and in particular, a study we did comparing um, greater Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area in California and their transit ridership trends. Um, so first, I'll just give some background and talk about um, the asymmetries of transit ridership. Um, then some further background about the two California regions that we're talking about and some relevant similarities and differences. Um, then the contours um, of falling ridership and how they differ between the two regions. Um, the factors behind those um, falling ridership trends and some key takeaways for practice as we move out of the pandemic. So first, public transit ridership is not evenly distributed. Um, this is an example from Greater Los Angeles. Just 2% of Angelinos ride very frequently, and that's something like 45 trips a month. 20% um, ride occasionally, um, so that's less than one trip a day, 12 trips per month. And the vast majority of people ride transit very little or not at all, um, so that's less than one trip a month. Um, the modal number of trips is, is zero, I believe. So transit ridership is heavily concentrated in a very small group of people. And to preview some findings later on, um, if those uh, riders start to ride less or not ride at all, it has an outsized impact on transit ridership overall. Um, in addition, a few areas generate most of transit trips. So here we have a graph of um, US census tracts broken down into seven built environment types um, from work that UCLA ITS did a couple of years ago. And the old urban neighborhoods, these are sort of the densest ones, most transit supportive areas of the country. They just represent 4% of all census tracts in America. Um, but they have a transit ridership share of 14% of trips compared to, you know, 3% or less in all the other areas. And for another example, this is the San Francisco Bay Area and the eight largest operators. And you can see a huge concentration of ridership scaled to the, the width of the line, scaled to ridership um, in downtown San Francisco. That's the sort of financial district and the uh, densest part of the city as well as between the East Bay, which is housing rich, and San Francisco, it's downtown. Um, and the rest of the region has relatively less ridership and the lines are somewhat spindly on this graph. So again, it's sort of a few areas are generating most of the trips as well. Um, and even down at the level of operators and lines, there's asymmetry. So I'll get into this more later, but um, BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit, that's the subway system in the Bay Area. Um, only one trip type on it, which is Transbay trips from the housing rich East Bay to the jobs rich San Francisco Peninsula. That one trip type on that one operator accounted for essentially all, almost all of the growth in transit ridership um, from 2012 to 2016. And all other ridership in the Bay Area held flat. So even when you get down to the level of operators and lines, um, transit ridership is very heavily asymmetrically concentrated. So here I'll get into a little bit of the two regions we studied and some key similarities and differences. Um, so for our larger study of California transit ridership trends from which this research is drawn, um, we looked at 
these regions, uh, these six regions, but here I focus just on the Bay Area in yellow and greater Los Angeles in blue. Um, they are the second and fifth largest regions in the US. Um, two thirds of Californians call one of these two mega regions home and California is the largest state in the country. Um, and their public transit and highway networks are planned as part of the first and fourth largest metropolitan planning organizations. So California is a fairly diverse and very populous state and the trends in California are in a lot of ways representative of trends across America. Um, to compare the two regions for a second, um, Greater Los Angeles is by far the most, uh, the more popular, uh, populous of the two, um, more than twice the number of people, um, but it's also the poorer of the two. Um, it still has a median income more than the overall median for the whole country, um, but less than the San Francisco Bay Area, which has um, an exceptionally high median income for America. Um, in terms of jobs per capita, you can see the Bay Area has far more jobs per people, um, and that comes into play later when we talk about commute transit trips. Um, and the share of those jobs that are in the central city um, is roughly comparable, though the city of LA is much larger than the city of San Francisco in terms of people and square miles. So now I'll get into the contours of falling transit ridership. And this, this sort of comes in two flavors. There's the biggest collapse in transit ridership that I'm sure we're all familiar with across the world um, since the pandemic. And this is data from Apple Maps looking at demand for transit globally in the US and in California respectively. And you can see that California fell farther and has stayed um, lower relative to its baseline for longer. Um, we've done some other research on um, ridership during the pandemic, but here, we're focusing on the decline in ridership that happened in the half decade before the pandemic, um, because it was not all smooth sailing even before um, 2020. So this is ridership trends in California and the US, and you can see they dipped um, in the Great Recession, as you might expect from economic conditions, recovered as the economy recovered. But then curiously, around 2014, transit ridership started to fall in the US and California, and this didn't accord with past historical patterns. The economy was relatively good and recovering. Um, trip taking was up. And so um, this sort of was perplexing for, for scholars and especially for transit operators themselves. Um, so to get to the bottom of this, we kind of wanted to look at the differences between the two regions and see if there was anything revelatory there. Um, and indeed there is. Um, you can see greater Los Angeles in blue and the Bay Area in yellow. Um, the scale of losses in Los Angeles are just staggering. Um, between 2014 and 2018, uh, Greater LA lost 128 million annual trips. Uh, that's a drop of 18%. And you can see it started falling in 2014 and really skidded um, for every year thereafter. Um, but in the Bay Area, the story looks very different. Ridership continued to climb into 2016 um, and then did begin to fall, um, but at a less steep rate. Um, and then if you sort of exclude the two largest operators, that's Muni, which is the um, city of San Francisco's um, transit system within the city and BART, which is the regional subway system. If you exclude those two, however, the Bay Area kind of looks halfway between um, where it does with those two operators and greater Los Angeles. So you can see those two mega operators really push the Bay Area to look very different than Los Angeles. Um, when you take a plot of ridership per capita, however, the trends are, are even steeper. Um, so in Los Angeles, it looks particularly worrisome. The decline after the Great Recession is basically erased, and it looks like a decade-long slide that just got worse in 2014. Um, but these declines aren't even. Um, they're not even across day of the week, time of day, parts of the region, mode, and route. So to further get into it, we broke down ridership trends along all of these different axes. Um, so here is ridership broken down by mode. Um, and you can see the difference is stark. Um, rail ridership has increased dramatically in both regions, um, especially as Greater Los Angeles has built out its rail network and bus ridership has declined and is driving a lot of the decline. Um, however, there are a lot of causes behind this 
uh, widening gap and it's quite concerning. But it's worth noting that in both regions and especially the Bay Area, rail ridership also began to stagnate and fall um, in 2014 to 16. So there's some set of causes that are affecting both rail and bus, probably affecting bus ridership more, um, but it's affecting both modes and this widening split isn't necessarily the reason for the declines um, in 2014 to 2020. Um, so next we turn to the largest operators in both of the regions. Um, in Los Angeles, LA Metro is the biggest operator. It carries 65% of the region's trips. But just this one operator alone accounts for over half of the whole state, not just the region, the whole state's decline um, in our key years, 2014 to 2018. And this one operator even accounts for over 10% of the entire nation's transit ridership losses. So really, the story of transit ridership loss in California and even in America in large part or in significant part boils down to LA Metro. Um, but the story looks very different in the Bay Area. Um, again, these two largest operators together are about the same share of regional trips. Um, but on Muni, there was only a 2% decline in these years and BART actually rose um, compared between 2014 and 2018. It's declined a bit since um, before the pandemic. But the large operators in the Bay Area are actually holding aloft the whole region's ridership. Um, and the same story is true by weekday versus weekend. On LA Metro, the declines are roughly across the board, whereas on BART in the Bay Area, weekday trips have held relatively steady, whereas weekend trips have really cratered and pulled down um, the operator and the region with them. Um, and again, you see the same story geographically. So these two maps scale ridership losses by line um, for the largest operators by the width of the line. Um, and you can see Bay Area has some losses, but relatively small and greater Los Angeles is covered in orange. Um, and a major reason the Bay Area's biggest operators have avoided the worst of the ridership decline is that transit use at peak times and in commute directions remain strong. Um, but the losses are far more spread out in LA. Um, it's interesting to note that for a sense of scale, just 21 routes in greater Los Angeles account for a quarter of the entire state's losses from 2015 to 2018, um, despite only carrying 14% of the state's trips. And a single block, lines passing through a single block in downtown Los Angeles account for 11% of the whole state's losses. So with these sort of glaring differences between the regions in mind, um, we wanted to see what possible explanation there might be and how it accords with these differences. Um, so first we looked at factors under the control of transit operators. So this is um, hours of service and there's sort of in other regions of America and the world, there's this talk of a death spiral where service cuts lead to ridership losses, which in turn lead to service cuts. Um, but we have the opposite going on here, that, right, that services actually increased, especially in greater Los Angeles, um, while ridership has declined. And this is worrisome for its own reasons. It means that the service is, is not, is being overwhelmed by other factors as ridership goes down and it's being delivered increasingly and efficiently. But it rules out service cuts as a possible factor. Um, the same goes for fares and spending. Um, the average transit fare in both regions is either relatively flat or rising evenly without any noticeable correlation with ridership trends. Um, and spending on transit is way up, um, especially in for rail and in greater Los Angeles, where um, there's a number of sales taxes that have gone toward public transit. So governments in the area, in these two regions are pouring money into transit. They're not raising fares and yet ridership is still down. So if not those, what might be behind ridership losses? Um, for both regions, we find that it's factors outside of the control of transit operators. And in greater Los Angeles, we sort of honed in on auto access and auto use. And in the Bay Area, we also pointed to um, changes in patterns of housing relative to employment. So we'll get into each of those in turn. Uh, big smoking gun in greater LA is private vehicle access. 
So here you can see the percent of zero vehicle households who um, are the type of riders, like I mentioned at the beginning, that overwhelmingly and disproportionately uh, ride transit compared to households with um, autos. And they declined a lot um, between 2000 and 2017. Um, just to give a sense of scale, um, the LA region added more than one new vehicle for every new resident um, between 2008 and 2018. Um, compared to only a quarter of a new vehicle for every new resident in the 90s. Um, so that had a large effect on transit ridership, as I'll show in a second. But in the Bay Area, the line is almost totally flat. Um, zero vehicle households and auto access really haven't changed a lot. So here's a, a model that my colleague Andy Scouten um, estimated of uh, predicted annual transit trips per capita in select years. Um, it takes into account a number of factors, um, but there's sort of two models here. The light blue one is sort of the counterfactual, what if auto access and uh, vehicle ownership had stayed the same? And the darker blue is a model that does account for changes in vehicle ownership. And you can see in California and Los Angeles, it really made the difference. Um, transit ridership would have been flat or slightly rising if not for these changes in vehicle uh, ownership. Um, in the Bay Area though, it, it doesn't really explain it. Um, but there is another form of auto access that has changed in the Bay Area that might be at work. Um, and that is ride hail. So ride hail services like Lyft and Uber are a way to purchase um, auto access one trip at a time. Um, they've existed longest in the Bay Area than anywhere else in the world. And the number of drivers per capita are higher there than anywhere else in the US. Um, there's a lot of studies that have looked at substitution for public transit versus complementarity and found substitution effects um, not only are higher, but also are higher in regions where Uber and Lyft have operated for longer. Unfortunately, though, we were unable to get uh, geographically disaggregated data from the ride hail companies. So we couldn't really look at trips at the scale necessary to analyze their role. Um, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence there that ride hail is at least playing some role. And in addition, in the Bay Area, there is um, an increasing imbalance between jobs and housing. Um, this has led to longer commutes. You can see across the state a 15% increase in commute distance. This is especially true in the Bay Area. Um, and the average length of a transit trip has gone up. This is both because commute trips have uh, gotten longer as people move out. But in addition, shorter trips like errands and other non-work trips are being made less and less often on transit, which makes the average transit trip length go up. Um, and this is in the context of California's housing uh, affordability crisis, which could be a whole nother slideshow, but it is having ripple effects in all sorts of um, other sectors, including transportation. So I'll just close with a few um, key takeaways. Um, between the two regions, we found significant differences in the timing and scope and uh, geographic scale of ridership losses. In greater Los Angeles, it was concentrated on the largest operator and sort of geographically spread out, spread out across days of the week and times of day. And the Bay Area, it was really off peak, non commute, and smaller operators that accounted for the ridership loss immediately before the pandemic. Um, despite these differences, we did find the commonality of increased auto access between the two. Um, but that meant something different in each region. That's increased personal vehicle ownership in greater LA and possibly um, increased use of ride hail in the Bay Area. Um, and so this points to the need to uh, implement strategies beyond the control of transit operators. So that means managing private vehicle travel through congestion pricing and dynamic parking pricing, um, and also taking steps to increase the supply and the affordability of housing near jobs and transit. Because when you locate housing near jobs, um, people can walk and bike and take transit to work rather easily compared to the auto-centric patterns of development that both regions exhibit today. Um, and finally, I'll just close by saying that this research points to the fact that transit can't just return to normal after the pandemic. Normal was at the bottom of a 20% slide in ridership. Um, there are these systemic issues that I've pointed out, and so transit operators and regional policymakers um, need to address them as we come out of the pandemic. So I'd just like to thank our research team who's pictured here. Um, they did so much work for this study um, and um, each took a different part of it. And um, I'm very happy with the results.
And you can find um, both the reports that we've done as well as short policy briefs that sum up our work on the ITS website, its.ucla.edu. Thanks so much. I'm having trouble hearing you if you're speaking. I think while he fixes it, if anybody has questions, please type it in the, into the chat. Um, if not, you can unmute yourself and um, or I can unmute it if you raise your hand and you can ask the question directly. Great presentation, Jacob. It was really nice to see all the different um, effects in the Bay Area and in California in general. Thank you, yeah. Um... We sort of focused on California, but we're seeing um, these trends uh, across across America as well. Yes, and then that Bay Area is especially interesting, just because of the number of cities that I was recently there, and I was just mind boggled at you know how many cities and agencies need to interact there, and uh, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, I think that you know. LA Metro has, has certainly taken a beating before the pandemic in terms of its ridership, um, but that does obscure the fact that it is such a large operator in uh, the LA region. And I know that um, trend systems around the world vary in terms of how integrated they are, but the Bay Area is, is one of the least um, integrated. I think there are 27 or so transit operators in the region and they don't coordinate schedules and fares. <laughs> Um, and that that certainly contributes to low transit ridership as well. Um, yeah, so we, we found that the smaller operators um, were really losing the most riders, um, but in the Bay Area that constitutes a larger share of transit ridership just because there are so many operators um, as compared to the one in Los Angeles that really dominates. Thank you, Yanta, is your mic fixed? Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, well, I think we can, if no one has questions, we can move to the last presentation, which, which is my presentation. Uh, let me just quickly introduce myself. I, I got my uh, bachelor's degree in Central South University, China, and I got my master's degree in transportation engineering from Imperial College, London. And then I started my PhD study at, study at the University of Texas at Austin in 2017 with Dr. Carl Kaufman. And my research interests are like in the uh, autonomous vehicle and network simulations, and also some like uh, optimization problems. Um, I have done uh, like a few projects with uh, Texas uh, Department of Transportation and, and also like the US Department of Transportation and NSF projects. So yeah, and, and I, I have also worked with a few national labs, like the Argo National Lab and National Renewable Energy Lab. And let me share my screen. Um, one second, let me, let me look, look up my files. Too many windows open. Um, okay. My screen. Okay. So my topic. 
is about shared automated vehicle fleets to serve Chicago's public transit. This is the work I did with uh, my colleagues at uh, Argo National Lab, the Mercy and Omer, and also uh, my advisor here at uh, UT Austin, my uh, Dr. Carl Kaufman. So just a few things what I want to mention about the shared automated vehicles. Um, they can bring traffic, safety, and environmental benefits because like they can accelerate and decelerate more smoothly. And and they can like uh, save the emissions if they are elect especially the electric vehicles. And these kind of vehicles have been successfully tested worldwide. And in the long term, they may cost as low as 40 cents per revenue mile based on previous study uh, using the shared automated vehicles to serve the total service. So we are expecting a mixed service of like different type of uh, a service that SAVs can provide. They can be the door-to-door -door service. They can be first mile, last mile service to uh, to connect to the bus or rail stations. They can also be um, like SAV-based transit lines. They can replace the existing traditional um, bus service with kind of a smaller size of vehicle, but more frequent service, but definitely a lower price for that. Um, another thing I want to mention like, is the reason we use shared automated vehicles for first mile, last mile connections. They offer faster speeds than walking and sometimes biking. And they avoid bad weather uh, when people like uh, carry a bike on transit or, or ca uh, carry a briefcase while they're walking. And there's no coordination needed. So in that case, neighbors or family members, they don't have to like uh, come and pick you up or drop you off at the, at the stations. And there's no special parking needed because the vehicles can just stop and go. But sometimes the idle in locations may be important to, 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 uh, to store such kind of uh, vehicle fleet. And the energy savings, they have energy savings over the conventional vehicles if they are like the uh, right size and they are all electric vehicles. So in this study, we used the Polaris uh, simulator, which is which has the, the mesoscopic dynamic traffic assignment for millions of agents. And we designed the first mile, last mile service to connect to both bus and rail stations with, and these are the two modes we added in the, in the motors model. We, uh, in, we uh, incorporated the wait time and access and egress travel time using the SAVs for the first mile, last mile service fit back to the motors model. So we, Run a few iterations to achieve a stable, uh, I mean, a stable um, uh, gap between the iterations. So the original, um, like walk and ride, I mean, walking to the transit stations is like about a quarter miles on average. But using the uh, SAVs, we have no distance constraints. So we can we can uh, travel along from a long distance to connect to the bus or rail stations, and we um, design the multimodal shortest path for shortest path travel times between all the origins and destinations. This is the network that we did for a simulation. On the right hand side is the road network. And on the right hand side is the traffic analysis zones and also the transit network. We simulated 20 county Chicago region with almost 20,000 TVs and 32,000 road links. And, and we have over uh, uh, 50,000 uh, transit stops and we have uh, 28,000 total transit vehicle trips over the day. I mean, these transit trips are connecting from the, like this original origin station to the destination stations. And we simulated 5% of the Chicago travel demand. The SAVs are assumed to cost 50 cents per mile. And we deploy the split such that an SAV is, uh, 
is like designed for 40 persons. So we deployed about uh, 12,000 vehicles across the network. There are uh, three scenarios that I designed and, and run. It's uh, so the first one is the door to door service scenario. Um, it's uh, it kind of replaces the traditional taxi service with, with a lower cost as a door to door service. And also in this scenario, we assumed uh, we used a, a household vehicle ownership model, but uh, which has been de developed uh, to relate uh, to a, a scenario case of shared automated vehicles. So using that model, we expected a reduction of the vehicle ownership from 0 0.66 to 0 0.37 uh, vehicles per capita in, uh, or in the household. So the next one, we added a first mile, last mile service on top of the door, -to -door service uh, across the region. But in that case, we used the same SAV fleet size for, uh, as the door, -to door scenario. And the last, we further added an um, SAV based transit service. As I mentioned, we have a reduce, we had like, we uh, reduced the vehicle size. So we, we now have 15 seats with 15 standing spaces instead of 30 seats and 30 standing spaces. And we have a lower cost, which is about 60% of the traditional bus service because we, we now don't have uh, drivers on board, that is a huge saving for the um, bus of, of, of reading cost. And we designed a scenario, designed such kind of service to replace Chicago's CTA and PACE uh, bus services. So here are the results for uh, from the simulation. Um, this is kind of the, the, the non uh, on demand service. Um, of the SAVs, which are the total door service and first mile, last mile service. I, I differentiated the service between these two and the SAV based transit because SAV based transit, they are just fixed throughout the fixed stop uh, service. So the, the stats here I showed, uh, they are just only the stats for the on demand service. So we can see that for the SAV's door-to-door -door service, the, the average service time across, across the Chicago region is about uh, 15 minutes. And there are almost like 99.4% uh, of the requests are met. An SAV can serve about 19.4 trips per day, but with about a quarter vehicle miles to be empty. So these empty miles are just, um, uh, the vehicle mile traveled without person on it, so they are just the dead heading distance to pick up to pick up a person. Um, and then, uh, and the SAV will run about 131 miles per day, and they they are in operations. Uh, the time they are in operations is about 4.2 hours. So with the first mile, last mile service added, you can see that the travel time increased a little bit, but we, we saw the uh, waiting time decreased. So, so we, since we use the same amount of fleet, the, the travel time increased because we have more people using the same fleet. But the wait, the wait time decreased, I think this is because we since the vehicles are connecting to the, like, the transit stations where people are more aggregated, people are connecting, uh, people are connecting to the um, to the stations and and dispatched from the stations. So we have more uh, aggregated requests. So people, uh, so the vehicles can be uh, more efficient in serving those people. And yeah, and we can also see from the following stats that we have about two hundred and sixty. Thousand uh, requests served per day, which which is about uh, thirty thousand increased requests, and one vehicle can serve twenty three point six uh, trips per day without much changing the bed heading distance. And further, when we have the um, sorry, 
when further when we have the um, SAV based transit added, uh, the stat is kind of um, kind of similar. Um, and this is because the SAVs are like mostly connected to the rail stations instead of bus stations. So when, when we replace the bus stations with the SAVs, the system performance uh, changed very little in this case. And the next, um, is the uh, the most bullets? Um, here are the four scenarios that I'm that I that I've designed. The first one is the business as usual. Um, so the the previously the taxi mode share is about four point one uh percent, and with the impact of the vehicle ownership model and also the uh the in introduction of the SAV storage service. We can see that um, the, the the like the total service or the on-demand service increased to sixteen point five percent with a reduction in the uh, single occupancy vehicle, and with the first mile last mile service added, you can see we have one point two percent of uh, the population to use the first mile last mile service, but we we, we have a little decrease in the transit itself. Because some of the people uh, would kind of shift to to the service of of the first mile last mile service. Yeah, the like the so in this case the transit uh, share increased from five point four to six point three. Yeah, it, it it is a small increase, but well, it it's relatively small, but. It's still a lot of in increase in the transit use across the Chicago region among among this uh, 13 million people. And the last, as I mentioned, since the service is, uh, is mostly connected to the rail service, so the mode share I changed the very a, a little. And this figure shows the uh, trip length distribution. Uh, it is uh, extracted from the scenario that has total door service and the first mile last mile service. We can see that the total door service has um, like uh, the distance are more longer than the first mile last mile service. The, some trips are longer than like 20 miles, um, but for the first mile last mile service, it's most mostly like constrained on the like the uh, uh, between 1.5 miles to three miles. And they are basically kind of uh, an extension of the transit catchment area. So in that case, people living around like three miles radius around these uh, trans transit stations will um, like tend to use the first mile, last, last mile service when we have the uh, SLA's function functioning as uh, to, to provide such kind of service. And we further um, provide the um, like the distribution of the trip counts, like the, uh, for the first mile last mile service across the time 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 of day. We can see the peaks at the morning peak and the afternoon peak. But like uh, an import, important uh, observation here is the rail stations are dominating the first mile last mile trips. It's about like eighty four percent. Compared to, uh, compared to the uh, bus service, and I think this is because uh, rail trips are often longer and they are not impacted by like the road congestion, and they have longer access and egress distance compared to the bus trips. So um, access and egress in rail stations using the first mile last mile service may reduce the total trip cost, and I even we consider the transfer penalties. And the next I want to, I want to mention is the SA boardings for the first mile last mile service, and it's kind of aligned with the previous results that we have like the heavily uh, boarding pattern on like along the lines of the of the rail lines. So kind of you can see the radial pattern, 
that follows follows the metro uh, rail line service of, of, of the Chicago region. And I didn't show the like morning peak and afternoon peak there because uh, um, the morning peak and afternoon peak pattern are not uh, quite obvious as the middle day pattern where they are more kind of connecting, directly connecting to the far suburban area and uh, like the city of Chicago. So it's kind of more aggregated at the city center. Yeah, so that's the, like the simulation we did to investigate like different services that uh, the SAV can provide to uh, like a large uh, metropolitan area. And accounting for 15% of the mode share, and the SAVs can offer 15 minutes, uh, 50 cents per mile total service for trips averaging 4.6 miles. Um, the first mile, last mile service raises the transit use from 5.4% to 6.3%. They better uh, utilize the SAVs fleet by serving 12% more requests per day with only 4% increase in vehicle miles traveled compared to using only the door-to-door -door service. And the most uh, first mile, last mile service is like, is from 1.7 to 0. Uh, uh, to 1.9 miles. Yeah, but like most of, most of them are aggregated between 1.5 to 3 uh, miles. And the connection to rail stations dominates the first mile, last mile trips. And for the future work, we can have, uh, so in this work, we assume that the uh, SAVs um, like ride sharing service using the dynamic ride sharing algorithm, we just assume that the people will travel by themselves. They will travel alone. So in the future work, we can incorporate uh, a multiple travel size. And we can also test on the uh, like the mode choice parameters to uh, uh, reflect the different preference of using uh, the shared automated vehicles. And last, we can also um, simulate electric vehicles to, in to incorporate uh, the vehicle's charging behavior. So that's kind of more realistic because uh, in, the, in the future, we are more likely to expect the vehicle to be electric and charging behavior cannot be, be, be avoided. Yeah, so that's the work uh, that I did. And you can find like the manuscript on, on my advisor's website. That's it. Thank you. Um, do you have any questions about my presentation? What do I have done? So my presentation is, I don't know, it's about 15 or 20 minutes, so it's not that long. So we are, we are early about a few minutes. Yeah, just let me know if you have. Um, yeah, so um, uh, the traffic congestion are captured using the dynamic traffic assignment in the simulator. And since it is a it is mesoscopic, so it's link transmission model that 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 we are using. But but we are we are only simulating 5% of the Chicago region. So because of the computation burden, but yeah, because, but, but now we have like a more powerful uh, com com computing source. So we are expecting to simulate about 25% of the region in 24 hours. So it's kind of different because a different from the door-to-door -door service because um, um, the first mile, last mile service has the multimodal routing. It, it incorporates different modes in it. So it's kind of raised the, raised the computation burden a lot by incorporating like the walking or uh, the, the bus trip or rail trips. 
So for the door-to-door -door service, so it kind of managed to run 100% in about six to eight hours. But yeah, it, it takes much longer for the case of the uh, first mile, last mile service. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, and anyway, you can find my paper on, on the website and um, and just email me or my advisor if you have any additional questions or comments. So I guess um, that's the end of this session. And thank you so much for joining us today.